BRI is a large state-owned enterprise that focuses on the MSME segment. BRI Digital Innovation continues to be carried out to facilitate customers in providing services to continue to give value to Indonesia. BNI harus semakin proaktif dan responsif. BNI terus konsisten untuk mendorong UMKM kita naik kelas. BNI berkomitmen dalam program-program pemberdayaan UMKM untuk Go Global. In Bank Mandiri, we are already one step forward, pioneering Indonesia's transition to low carbon economy by pursuing net zero emissions on operational by 2030. Let's put our hands together to create a brighter future. Mining industry Indonesia. Mind ID, we explore natural resources for civilization, prosperity, and a brighter future. is a large state-owned enterprise that focuses on the MSME segment. BRI Digital Innovation continues to be carried out to facilitate customers in providing services to continue to give value to Indonesia. Good afternoon, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome back to all of you to the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023, implementation of ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. I hope all of you have enjoyed the previous sessions and also had the opportunity to engage in valuable conversations and also networking. Now we are excited to continue our journey of knowledge sharing and collaboration. But once again, we'd like to thank all of you for being part of this incredible event. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, let's rekindle our enthusiasm and focus as we move on to the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, this next session resonates with the spirit of collaboration and also progress. It is about building an inclusive, creative economy ecosystem, which will take place as a fireside chat. So without further ado, let's take a seat and begin this enriching conversation. This session will be moderated by a news anchor. Please welcome Mr. Timothy Marbun and our esteemed speaker today, the Secretary of State, Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts of Cambodia, Her Excellency Pen Moni Makara. The stage is yours. How are you, Madam Pen? 
Good afternoon, Timothy. Good afternoon to you too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to you all uh, for joining us. Thank you for joining us in our fireside chat. Our topic today is building an inclusive, creative uh, economy, creative economy ecosystem. And we are here to explore lessons that we can learn from Cambodia's remarkable journey in fostering a diverse, innovative, and sustainable creative economy while also preserving its very rich cultural heritage. Now, today we have the honor of learning from Her Excellency Pen Moni Makara, a distinguished leader in diplomacy and cultural affairs. She is currently serving as the Secretary of State at the Ministry of Culture and Fine Arts of Cambodia. And I'm sure her extensive experience has made her an invaluable contributor to cultural exchange and also in artistic collaboration in both regional and also a global scale. Now, Today, uh, we wish to delve into Cambodia's uh, creative economy evolution, its alignment as well to other ASEAN countries, and uh, strategies behind promoting diversity uh, and also inclusivity. Now, furthermore, we will try to contemplate on how ASEAN can position itself for a regional uh, hub for creative industries, as that's what we wish to be, fostering a shared identity between ASEAN countries and also raising awareness of the very immense creative energy, creative potential that we have uh, within our diverse nation. So, Madam Pen, uh, first, could, would you tell us how the creative industry is in Cambodia? Uh, what areas are you uh, excited about at this moment? Uh, as we want to know more about the creative industry at Cambodia at the moment. Madam Pen. Yes, so thank you, um, Timothy. And uh, before I get into um, Cambodia itself, I would like to um, first like to thank Indonesia, the host, uh, for being for championing the creative economy um, and also uh, giving Cambodia an opportunity to give our perspective and insight. Mm -hmm. Even though we are, our creative economy is still at a developing stage right now. As if you, we compare to say Thailand mm. or the Philippines, the Philippines is a, a, also another ASEAN country that we look up to in, uh, in terms of the um, development of the creative economy. Um, and I really congratulate, want to congratulate them on the um, just the recently, well, last year passing through the new law yeah. on a new act on the creative economy industry act and also managed to get um, the creative economy development council so uh, indonesia uh, thailand and the philippine uh, countries that um, cambodia it, they are the creative economy leaders in asean that cambodia aspire to be oh, we also have a lot to learn uh, in that <laughs> note actually but uh, we're, I'm sure we're eager to learn together. And as I said, there's a similarity, uh, a same spirit, and even we see very similar cultural heritages between our countries. Now, uh, I'd like to know, in Cambodia, when we talk about creative industry, what would come up to mind in first? What would be the most advanced at the moment? Okay. So, uh, Cambodia uh, being relatively small, we have a population of around just over 16 million. Mm. And given that we have this um, long-spanning histories, we and we have a rich culture in terms. Of, we even have we are the land of the thousands temples mm -hmm. and uh, and um, the home of the um, uh, World Heritage Site Angkor, where yeah. the biggest um, religious monuments um, in the world. Um, therefore, our Creative um, economy is actually very much culture based. Mm. It's very much culture based. Uh, our tourism sector, it, which is uh, in some way related to the creative economy, is also about 80 to 90 percent culture based. Mm. Okay. Yes. So that is the main feature, uh, similar to a lot of ASEAN countries as well. How do you utilize the creative use, the energy uh, of creativity in Cambodia? As, as we know, there's always a link between creative industry and the tourism aspect there. How do you utilize that? How do, what is Cambodia doing at the moment? So, uh, like I mentioned earlier, for, for tourism, it's culture-based, so we have many, many um, religious structure yeah. and, um, and monuments um, and also incredibly old um, and historic building uh, around the country. 
and within those um, within uh, the area where those religious or monuments, uh, those uh, tourism attraction um, centers, we have the ecosystem of the community. Mm. The community, the local community living um, um, there, they have their own um, com traditional knowledge, traditional um, and community knowledge, and where they, they, they have their own um, craft, mm. arts and craft and design, and um, whether it's in terms of uh, clothing, fashions, or you know, souvenirs and things like that. So uh, this is where the, our creative, the main uh, um, sector of our creative um, economy. I'm guessing if, if it's anything like, um, I'll say Indonesia, uh, of course I'm most familiar with the Indonesian situation, but just as an example, it's there, you know, the creativity is there, the energy is there, mm. the ability is there, uh, but it takes more than just having it to actually create the whole industry, to create it, especially to becoming a, a whole motor. Correct me if I'm wrong, you, we've talked before this, uh, you've mentioned that Cam Cambodia's youth, the, under, the below 30 population is more than... 80%, 80%. More than 80%. More than 80% is below 30. Below 30 years old. So, so we, have, we, have, we have three things. Cambodia has three things that we have a lot of. Uh, we have fertile soil. Mm. We have young population. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing is our cultural asset. Mm -hmm. Yes. So what, what, need, what, 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 what do you need now to make the creative industry really move and advance? So uh, the first thing we need are a more organized plan. Okay. Um, like like I, I mentioned earlier, we are actually studying and actually um, looking up to our ASEAN neighbors, such as Thailand, Philippines, and Indonesia, so that we can uh, formulate a more um, strategic, creative economy uh, uh, development plan. Because right now, we do not have a dedicated agency or institution mm. that is responsible for this. What we have is a separate um, ministry that sort of have our own policy and our own program mm. to, to foster creativity. So for example, the Ministry of Culture and Fine Art, we have our own uh, fostering program. Uh, the Ministry of Women Affairs, they, they focus more on um, the female entrepreneurs in the uh, micro and small enterprise, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but now, right now, we are in a phase of, um, we in a phase of data collection and also analyzing. Mm -hmm. So we are finishing off our cultural mapping. Of course, it's not, you can, you can never finish our cultural yeah. mapping, but we are updating. Uh, we're updating uh, the cultural mapping of our communities and, and from that we are going to make a proposal to our, our, the leaders, our new government, which was just, is just formed a few weeks ago. So Cambodia has a new government, new prime minister, and he's very excited and very much in uh, pushing for diversification of our economy, yeah. So a lot of hopes for the new government to put more attention on the creative uh, economy in Cambodia as well. Now, uh, any rooms for collaboration with ASEAN or Indo-Pacific countries? What, what area, what key areas would you say is ready for collaboration in Cambodia? Um, you know, Cambodia is always very open to uh, collaboration in a, any sector. Um, especially within this new mandate, uh, we are very much um, open for any proposal uh, from private or state. Um, uh, within the creative economy, for, I would give specific example for, for us in the Ministry of Culture and Fine Art, whether it's film, whether it's content building, capacity building, we have ambitious plan uh, on um, building uh, developing uh, our uh, creative uh, school. So we have secondary school and uh, University of Fine Art under our ministry responsibility. But um, we have not focused on the, the digital side, not much, but we are, we are creating this plan and we are looking for partners. We also 
um, wanting to um, grow our film industry. So it starts from uh, cooperation and capacity building. Mm -hmm. That that is is, is also seek for cooperation. investments. Investment, yes, mm -hmm. um, in any sector. Um, I know that because we have um, the ASEAN Summit Leader Summit um, on just uh, this morning. And I'm sure our new Prime Minister, he mentioned that Cambodia was very much open to investment and we'll try uh, our absolute best to make environment um, viable for investment, yes. Now, uh, I just want to touch a, a little upon technology. So how have the creative industry in Cambodia utilized the technology? Uh, just to answer a few questions here. Uh, is it really open for like social media and and how open are you and also um, how has it been utilized so yes because of our young population we are very much open to social media mm. so right now we have all the uh, Facebook Instagram TikTok Twitter whatever you <laughs> they can get Do you have a TikTok we, I, I don't. You don't have, okay. I'm, I'm just checking. Maybe I'm not young enough. <laughs> I, I, I pretend, I, I try to look young, but I am not young enough. Actually, I do have access to TikTok. Okay. But, yes, I Same with me then. Only have access. I yes. don't know what to fill in. But <laughs> it's incredibly... Um, it's growing there. It's the yeah. fastest growing uh, okay. app um, because of our young population. Okay, and, and they're very eager to create through those... Platforms? Oh yes, there's all sorts of contents. There's all sorts of contents um, up there uh, in, in, in TikTok and especially for, for younger people. And we have content from Cambodians from around the world as well. Mm. So um, it's very, it's, it really, uh, all this social media, it makes the world smaller. Yeah. But it's also an incredibly effective way of um, uh, giving off uh, high volume communication mm. you know, when you yeah have you uh, has it been utilized to promote what Cam cambodia can offer in the creative aspect or creative economy aspect um the tourism industry has been um you know after covid you know what happened during the pandemic most uh how our tourism industry which is one of the main um economic contributor uh, in Cambodia, mm. our tour tourism industry, uh, how much it declined during COVID. And um, I think the Ministry of Tourism has uh, uh, utilized uh, social media as a, as a way to promote uh, tourism in the country, mm. which is very effective, especially it, they managed to drive up the, um, not just international, but um, national tourism as well within the country, mm. make people want to go out. Okay. And yeah. So my, uh, my final question will be t touching upon inclusivity. Uh, as we know that, that the, the creative sector, uh, it, it, will, it will grow. We have the tools, the technology, as you said, it's also been utilized. But how, what, what is Cambodia doing to keep it inclusive for everyone? How do you keep it uh, more and more sustainable, uh, especially in Cambodia as, as the industry grows? How do we make it more inclusive for everyone? So. Um, we like like I've mentioned because we have many ministry involved. Mm. So, um, for example, um, for us, we we a lot of focus is on not just on the youth, but on the um, local community yeah. as well. So, um, we have a program called the the Living Legend um, mm. in the uh, traditional community. So. So we, we, we go and explore different local community and then we, we've actually um, given um, a special um, decoration for any um, com um, elders in a community or people in a community who are, who are specialized in their art, for example, and that is um, Ministry of, of uh, Culture. So Ministry of Women Affairs, they focus mm. on fostering um, women enterprises. So and the Ministry of um, Education focus a lot on the youth mm. um, sector. Mm. So, and, and we are very much, uh, we have a special uh, program that involves um, artists with disability, for example. 
So we have that, and also we have a special um, policy on we call the, what we call the indigenous um, um, support system. So to all the um, ethnic minority or indigenous um, in within the country as well. So there's also capacity building for them, for them getting them involved as well. Yes, getting in touch uh, with, their, um, with their tradition, make sure that their tradition don't die out, for example, they, for the indigenous minority. Um, yes, and I have one exciting uh, new um, program that I'd like to share with you, just quickly mm -hmm. share with you, and that is to do with um, what we call the ancestral uh, skill training uh, program, which is part of the youth training program. Um, the new government has uh, uh, put, uh, uh, within the new mandate, we have a, a capacity building group program for 1.5 million youth. Okay. Yes, very. From, from the new government. It's from the new yeah. government. So within uh, this, this, this program, is uh, currently uh, will be rolling out shortly, okay. and um, and for the creative sector, for the cultural and creative sector, we get uh, two to four percent of this 1.5 million, mm -hmm. making it um, 30,000 uh, to 60,000 mm. um, youth. Okay. Yes. So we'll be training a specific um, traditional skill that can be used. Uh, to earn live a living. I see. Yes. Okay. So it's not just traditional skill for you to be aware of. No, it's a skill that you can use to earn a living. Okay. Yeah. So, th so that hopefully would also grow, the, let, let the industry grow, as well as a capacity building and collaboration. I think that's areas for collaboration as well. Yes. Now uh, our time is up, but I thank you very much. Let's give a round of applause to uh, Madam Pen, Madam Pen Moni Makara. The Secretary of State, Ministry of Cultural and Fine Arts of Cambodia. So, thank once again, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, and also to our moderator for that very lively fireside chat. Once again, why don't we give another round of applause, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you very much. And so, Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we continue our exploration of the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023, please allow me to welcome to the stage the Regional Director of Korea Creative Content Agency, Koka, for his brief presentation. Please welcome Mr. Kim Yong-soo. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, esteemed guests, good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, the Slamas Yangsmuanya. My name is Kim Yong Su, Regional uh, Director of Korea Creative Content Agency, Indonesia. I'm honored to have this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience uh, today. Uh, I'm here to share to you uh, how Coca builds on inclusive creative economy ecosystem through Korea 360. Established in May 2009, COCA is a government organization to promote cultural content and uh, creative industry under the Ministry of Culture, Sports and Tourism of the Republic of Korea. COCA supports uh, uh, production, planning, and creation, distribution, overseas expansion, business growth, uh, training, R&D, uh, policy financing, and policy study of many different genres, including uh, broadcasting, uh, video game, music, fashion, animation, character licensing, uh, comics IP, and new technology convergence content. Among our major support activities, uh, are as follow. As you know, uh, Squid Game through Studio Cube uh, for infrastructure support, Extraordinary Authentic U for human uh, resource development, Baby Shark, uh, Pink Phone, and Descendant of the Sun for IP overseas expansion. Through the support and business promotion program from COCA, Korea's content market sales reached 144.4 trillion Korean won. Exports of 13.5 billion US dollar 
and employment of uh, 607,000 people, which becomes the seventh largest market in the world. The Korean government recognized that the core of the creative economy is the overseas expansion of related industry, in particular, the content industry, which is regarded as a high-value-adding industry, is being fostered as a base industry for the creative economy. And the global expansion of related industries through the Korean wave is of our uh, vital importance. The Korean wave, or Hallyu, uh, began in 1997. At the time, only Chinese and Japanese uh, consumer. Okay, sorry. At the time, only Chinese and Japanese consumer uh, preferred the Korean drama, K-pop, and games. But now, Korean wave also uh, gains popularity in ASEAN countries. This is also evident in uh, statistical figures. Compared to 2019, exports increased by 25.6% in uh, 2020 during COVID period, and are expected to increase by double digit in 2021. In Indonesia, uh, Hallyu is becoming a daily culture based on K-content consumption by country. Indonesia has the highest intention to purchase Korean uh, products and services such as K-pop and uh, dramas uh, followed by uh, Vietnam, India, UAE, and China. Therefore, in December 2022, uh, COCA established the Korea 360, a comprehensive uh, exhibition center for Hallyu, which is located inside the Lotte Mall, Jakarta jointly with the four ministries, including the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism. Korea 360, as a base for spreading Hallyu in ASEAN, is located to uh, strengthen the Korean brand, uh, provide opportunities to experience new Hallyu culture, secure a Hallyu fandom targeting the new generation, and revitalize the creative economy by leaping into a country with attractive Hallyu culture. In Korea 360, you may find a hand print of a Korean celebrity collect on a permanent exhibition where you can experience a Korean content, lifestyle, uh, food, culture, and tourism, and uh, various other Korean content-related events. The number of our visitors are increasing steadily as we have carried out a 60 promotional event collaborating with 1,932 Korean brand and 4,292 uh, products. Revitalizing the national economy through creative industry is a common goal and concern of Korea and all ASEAN member countries. However, a common approach to these goals and concern may not fit, uh, since there are some differences of economic, uh, political, and cultural background of each country. Uh, today, I share the methodology for revitalizing the creative economy based on uh, content consumption and added value uh, through our Korea 360. We believe that experience the content will lead to actual product consumption as source of a sustainable creative economy. So enhancing IP development, uh, elevating creative economy ecosystem. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Kim Yong Soo, as our esteemed speaker for your session today. And so, ladies and gentlemen, before we move on, we will continue with another panel discussion. Again, we are here gathered at Ballroom 3. We're going to discuss more about creative economy. And knowing that we're joining the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum, implementation of the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, which is a flagship event organized by Indonesia as part of its ASEAN chairmanship in 2023. Again, in this forum, we do hope to unlock further opportunities and we can build stronger connections between the ASEAN countries and also the Indo-Pacific. 
And we also hope that this will serve as an inclusive platform for ASEAN member states and partners, mainly from the public and private sectors, to engage in constructive discussions, and we can together identify potential tangible projects and promote collaboration in the Indo-Pacific. One of the three major issues of future that will be discussed today, ladies and gentlemen, is digital transformation and creative economy. Now, this sub-theme aims to address concrete ways to leverage technology and also innovation in order to drive economic growth and also diversification. How we can together promote creativity, how we can empower businesses in this digital era through a digital transformation and also creative economy. And we're very happy to have 88 speakers and gathered 2,500 participants from 51 countries. And so ladies and gentlemen, for this next panel discussion, we are going to shift our focus to recovery momentum, advancing creative industry and tourism as experience economy. And we do also hope that being talked in this session today about how to build an inclusive creative economy ecosystem, our key speakers will be able to share their experiences, their thoughts, their insights to all of us. So with that, for this session, let's transition and continue to explore these ideas together. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming once again to our stage, Mr. Timothy Marwood as our moderator, and our esteemed speakers today, Mr. Johnny Oscaria, CEO of Enjourney, Mr. Yang Lee, Head of Public Affairs, Asia Pacific of Booking.com. And we're also delighted to have Ms. Mantini Yongviko, Director of Creative City Development of Thailand Creative Economy. So, Mr. Timothy Marbun, you have the floor. Good day, everyone. I believe I just said that 20 minutes ago as well. <laughs> so thank you for staying with us in Ballroom 3. A very exciting topic uh, we have here today. Uh, once again, welcome to all the speakers. Uh, welcome to Indonesia, if anyone has only been for the first time here. Um, we are talking about recovering momentum, advancing the creative industry and tourism as experience economy. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to lie to you. As you sit here in the beautiful Hotel Mulia in Jakarta, your host, which in this situation is Indonesia, secretly hopes that you've seen enough, experienced enough for you to come back, probably bring your family, you know, and have a vacation. Hopefully you enjoy enough Jakarta or even Indonesia. And this is what happens every time we have events like this in ASEAN countries. Any ASEAN countries, say Laos, Thailand, or any ASEAN countries, we try to use this momentum to showcase the best that we have in arts, culture, uh, people, services, and also even uh, nature when we can. Now, our region, the ASEAN region and the Indo-Pacific as well, is, is, is a very rich uh, heritage culture. It's so rich culture, so diverse. But at the same time, we see in ASEAN countries, if you look closer, we have lingering similarities you know, in our folklores, in our heritage, and in the shapes of our temples as well. So it shows that from a very long time ago, we've been working together. We have a Thai as well here uh, in, in the region. And creative economy has been uh, the very foremost and been very successful in showcasing the very rich socio-cultural heritage that ASEAN has. With the help of technology, it has never been easier for us to showcase this. It has never been easier for us as well to book your flight to the next Southeast Asian destination that you've probably had bookmarked in your Instagram for the last year, or maybe even more than that. I know I have a lot of booked, bookmarked areas that I haven't been going since COVID. So uh, Southeast Asia is one. Now we'll be talking about uh, the creative economy and also its uh, support in tourism. But there's also an aspect where, as we see a growth here, there's all, there are also challenges that also come up. Uh, maintaining fair prices is one as well, you know, and also ensuring uh, inclusivity and sustainability 
as the numbers grow, sustainability is getting harder and harder to uh, reach as well. We should not leave this in the back burner. It should also be one of our focuses as well as we grow together. Now, uh, I'm sure we will have great insights from our speakers today. Uh, please allow me to just give a short introduction to our speakers. Um, first speaker, uh, he was previously the Vice President, Director and Commissioner of Indonesia's flagship air carrier Garuda. Uh, a familiar face in tourism and also aviation industry. Uh, he now leads InJourney. InJourney is a state-owned holding company consisting of airport, cargo services, tourist attractions, hotels, product retail management, creative industry as well, and also InJourney is dubbed to be the future of tourism in Indonesia. Welcome uh, the CEO of InJourney, Mr. Doni Oscaria. Let's give a round of applause. Thank Adoni. you. Our next speaker has held senior roles in public affairs and public policy in Food Panda, also in Jewel Labs and advisory firms such as APCO Worldwide and also Asia Group Advisors. Uh, he is very passionate about ensuring businesses that grow in sustainable and ethical manner uh, while also building trust win-win relationships with key stakeholders. He is the head of public affairs for Asia Pacific at Booking.com, Mr. Yang Li. Please give a round of applause to Mr. Yang Li. And our next speaker has a proven track record in orchestrating successful Design Week events in Thailand to celebrate innovation and design. She also initiated district developments, uh, fostering collaborations within the Thai Creative District Network and established strategic partnership with UNESCO. And she is now the Director of Creative City Development of Thailand Creative Economy. Please welcome Ms. Montine Yongkivu. So I've said enough. Uh, I only have questions next. <laughs> so, uh, my first question is for everyone here, but I, I, I'll just start off with Madoni and go uh, further on later on. So, uh, what we want to talk about first is the change that you've seen, uh, especially if we compare it to pre-COVID and, uh, and post-COVID. So, uh, what is the most profound impact and changes that you see uh, in the creative economy and tourism sectors uh, f that fundamentally is altering the way that we consume uh, the industry? Uh, and, and the whole landscape. What biggest, what is impacted the biggest and what change do you see? So I'll start with you, Madoni. Thank you, Timothy. Uh, before I explain about the change on the tourism mm. and creative economy, I would like to express the, you know, the, the change in how Indonesia changed the strategy in tourism and creative economy before mm. In the, in the past five years, in the last five years, the government changed the way we're approaching this industry. Before, we were more focusing on marketing. Mm. But in the last five years, we realized that this industry basically is based on the destination. Yeah. So we changed the whole way. We, you know, we, we manage this industry. Now, since uh, we understand that the last five years, the government already introduced the five super priority destination yeah. for Indonesia. And, and, then, and just two years after we introduced the five super priority destination, the COVID have happened. Yeah. Yeah. And then during the COVID, we using this time to establish new company that called InJourney. InJourney is actually the holding, uh, uh, the holding company for the aviation and, and tourism. Mm. So this is, will be the, the changes to the whole ecosystem of Indonesian tourism. And your task with that. Yes. <laughs> okay. and, and this is the first ecosystem holding, actually, for the Indonesia. Mm. So during the pandemic, we think that the behavior of the customer will be changed. Okay. So we prepare to, you know, to, to, to change also the way we are manage our, our uh, company. But now, after the COVID is finished, yeah, we see that the tourism industry is still the same. Okay. People still want to touch something. People still want to see something. Mm. Before we think that the behavior of the customer will be changed now more on virtual and more on the online. But in fact, like in Indonesia, basically we have two inbound airports, since we, we also yeah. manage the airports here. Jakarta and, and uh, then Pasar. Yeah. But yes, it, it changed on the, on the business sector because Jakarta is more, the visitor to Jakarta is more on the business. business yeah. But in Bali, they're more on the tourism. Yeah. 
like today we see that the numbers of visitors to Denpasar is we already reached 95 percent before COVID. Mm. So the way people uh, uh, do the travel, uh, the, the tourism is still the same. Okay. But of course, the way the distribution model is 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 different now. Yeah, people mm. more on the online booking and, and and everything. But in the business side, we're facing a, a big change. Like in Jakarta before, like, like in Jakarta, the recovery rate for the Jakarta is already 35 percent. It's only 35 percent. This means that in the business sectors, the behavior of the customers is changed, but on the, on the tourism, that's still the same like the, okay. the, the before COVID. Interesting. Maybe Bookings has also numbers on that. Is, is, is there, because I would guess that uh, it's been good after COVID, but uh, Padoni just said that there's a difference between tourism and also business travels. Do you see that as well, or what changes have you seen? Yeah, thank, thank you for the, uh, the question. Um, I mean, for just for everyone who doesn't know, Booking.com, we're an online travel platform. You can book hotels. You can book flights now as well, as well as attractions. So we, I we're also doubt expanding anyone, the scope Anyone of doesn't business. know Booking.com. So. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, obviously pre-COVID, um, we uh, actually, the, the biggest change that we see is people obviously got online during COVID. Um, we saw our search numbers increase significantly during COVID. Um, and that pattern of using online services generally has gone up. Um, you know, we obviously have a lot of conversations with, um, you know, physical in-person agents that book hotels and book flights. That usage went down significantly during mm -hmm. COVID, right? And, and, and that's probably pretty obvious because everybody started using online services. That trend of using online services, particularly on our, our platform, has significantly rebounded. Uh, as Pagdani and, and Timothy alluded to, you know, we saw a increase to 150% of our COVID number sales in 2022. So that's last year. Uh, that number has since plateaued a bit uh, as sort of, you know, what we saw was a lot of pent-up demand. People, as Pakdani said, people want to experience physical things. Yeah. No offense to our friends at Meta who wants, you know, tourists <laughs> to experience the metaverse, but I think people still want to experience uh, physical uh, things and physical destinations. So that has absolutely not changed. Um, I think a couple of trends uh, related to travel that we have seen uh, that has been a market shift compared to pre-COVID is that increase in intra-ASEAN and intra-Asia Pacific travel has significantly uh, gone up. Um, we saw a, a tremendous surge in domestic US travel. That is cooling a bit. Um, we also, all of us, I think, expected a, a strong rebound of the Chinese traveler. That has not emerged. So, so far, we're still wondering, you know, when that boost will come. Mm. But I think on the, that's on the demand side. I think the other side, which is the supply side, um, to Bagdani's uh, former uh, employer, mm. is I think part of the constraint of travel has to do with how airlines and how hoteliers and how hospitality providers are able to provide capacity. So we know that a lot of the Chinese airlines have struggled to build back capacity. A lot of the planes that they have mothballed can actually be brought back to service. They have to buy new planes, and new planes aren't just rolling off the supply line, yeah. right? So I think part of the reason we're not seeing the Chinese traveler isn't because they don't want to travel. It's because plane tickets are exceptionally expensive. Mm. For all of you guys who have flown here, I'm sure um, you know, the budgets have increased <laughs> for, for covering flights. Yeah. Um, so I think part of that is a supply side constraint. And if we see the prices go down, I think we'll see shifts in travel patterns again. Okay. Um, and I think one last trend that we're seeing is the rise of what we call the bee leisure travel, mm. which is business travel is the primary activity followed by leisure either right before or right after. Okay. I think what's happening is that people want to bundle trips together because they're able to work uh, from home or work remotely. Mm. I think that work remote culture is actually exp expanding to travel because people don't feel like they have to go fly right back to the office. I see. I yeah. see. So the flights to Bali maybe Padoni, they also work in Bali. Right? Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. but instead of just stopping in Jakarta, let's just go to Bali work from there. I guess maybe, maybe that answers a little bit uh, of that aspect. So, Ms. Montini, uh, from the creative economy sector in Thailand, what do you see? What changes do you see? So, do you hear me? So, um, my job is like, I come from the different angle from these two gentlemen, but I have to work with them because uh, I work for uh, like, to support the creator. 
the creative industry in Thailand. And after the COVID, we saw that uh, the people access to internet more and more. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the online content is a big trigger for uh, tourism industry. That's why we try to promote the content industry like film, music, and uh, series in Thailand to trigger the young generation to come to uh, travel and also like to create more value uh, in terms of business. Mm -hmm. And uh, we saw another part of uh, change in Thailand as well, like uh, once the destination is still important. So that's why we saw many creators return to local uh, area like that in many provinces in Thailand because uh, among, the, in, among the COVID, the cost of living is high up and then they relocate their business to local or their hometown. So we found that there's a lot of creators in local area and then they can gather to be like uh, the creative group to create some mm -hmm. kind of event that's very interesting like mm -hmm. the festival or the uh, the recipe, uh, I mean the, 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 the taste of local, they change the perspective of the traditional festival to be the creative mm. festival that can attract the new tourists, uh, especially the young generation. So this is uh, the things that we saw and then we try to support them to happen more and more. Oh, so that, that happens locally in the communities? Yes. Oh, beginning from them? Right, right, right. Okay. So is, is there, is, um, has there been challenges in in you know uh, building the industry uh, and how has it been post covid after covid uh, would you say that you're twice stronger or has it been challenging to get get back to the situation before covid uh yeah um it's it's very challenging because um uh, to get back before um the creative industry in Thailand, uh, not much uh, that can uh, grow up because of mm. uh, the ecosystem, in some ecosystem, like recreation or some uh, funding, lack of funding. But, but, we, but fortunately, the online market open for the creator, creative content that they can uh, find a way to get back and then can connect to the global market more and more. At least it, it provides them a platform. Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, now, I'm, I'm moving on to the, the nexus between tourism and also the creative industry. We know, uh, we know that they, this, the creative uh, community as, as well, it could really help people experience more and therefore bring more tourists uh, to wherever destination it is. Now, uh, what would you say is the nexus and, and which uh, areas, which key cross-sector opportunities did you, do you see uh, in the very near future that can be done to promote this and probably, you know, to, to build the creative industry and to support more uh, the tourism, especially in, in the ASEAN Indo-Pacific area? Um, we understand that the tourism and the creative economic is like uh, two sides of the coins. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So we cannot Sometimes, like in Indonesia, we're using the creative economy as, as the attraction for the tourism. Mm. Like uh, in Bali, for example, yeah. some of the tourists come to Bali because of they want to see the tari kecak or something like yeah. that, the kecak yeah. dance and everything. They know so, what they're coming yeah, for. Yeah, they know, they know the reason why they come to the, to the some destination because of the creative industry yeah. also. So in this case, in Indonesia, the minister of tourism Mm. It's, it's also responsible for the creative economy. So, yeah. so I think now is like in Indonesia now today is we more develop on the, 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 the destination based on the creative economy. Like we just relaunched our uh, the miniature of Indonesia, the Taman Mini is the mm. content of the creative economy. Mm. So we we you know we develop this as a attraction for the tourism. Mm. So I think in the future, these two. The, the, you know, the tourism and the creative economy should be worked together because when the, if the creative industry, uh, 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 we can use also as a, as a yeah. tools to promote our, our destination. Mm -hmm. and, and also in the, in the tourism, yeah, most of the tourists also, 
you're looking for the creative yeah. industry. So we, I, I think this, the both industries should, should work together. Mm. So uh, what is Indonesia doing for that? What do you see? Now, is, I think uh, we, we change some policies also in the okay. creative industry. To, to, we're using this as a promise to promote our, our tourism. Like in the movie, we're starting to change the policy before, you know, some re restriction to the, in the movie industry by, by, uh, in, the, in our policy. Now we mm -hmm. change the whole policy now. The Indonesian now is starting to use the, the creative in the industry to promote our, our tourism. Mm -hmm. and, and, and very you know, prepared to do so at, yes. at this moment. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Lee, maybe you have an opinion. I'm sure you have an opinion on, on this as well. You might see the link between that, the creative uh, industry in, 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 in certain areas like ASEAN, Indonesia, Thailand, and other areas to tourism, is there like a strong link? And, and what, how, how can we really utilize this link? What do we need to know from the booking.com side? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, intricately linked. So, I mean, people go to a place because um, that destination has uh, local art, it has sport, mm -hmm. you know. Um, people visit a place not just because of the destination, I mean, what is a destination made up of? Yep. It's made up of history, it's made up of individuals, it's made up of stories. Right and and Booking.com, you know, we we completely believe in that. Uh, we're um, uh, one of our key kind of focuses in terms of marketing uh, is sponsoring major sporting events. Uh, you guys might have seen that we sponsored the Super Bowl in the U.S. Mm. We sponsored FIFA Women's World Cup. Uh, we sponsored the International Cricket Championships this year, um, and we are continuing to sponsor these major major sporting events um, because we believe that people uh, seek to go to those things. Mm. And if you see the attendance numbers, they're absolutely matching that, um, that uh, uh, assumption. So mm. in, beyond that, we also believe that um, local content is extremely uh, actually useful and very, very um, a big draw. So for example, um, I think someone from COCA was just here and yeah. talked about the way, the Korean wave. Yeah. It's actually, we are running a campaign now called the Ultimate K-Pop Suite. And basically what it is, is you get to come and visit the favorite restaurants, cafes, and bars of your K-pop star that you recognize from TV. Those restaurants have been there for years. Correct. But and nobody knows about them, <laughs> yeah, right? nobody knows about them. Or for example, um, the Netflix show Crashing Onto You. I don't know if you guys know about that. Okay. It put the town of a Switzerland town called uh, Isselwald, which is a fishing village of 400 people. It completely overran with tourists because of that Netflix show. Yeah. So the connection between creative economy and tourism is extremely close, in fact. Mm -hmm. And actually, because of COVID, because everybody was consuming Netflix and Amazon Prime and Disney Video during, Netf uh, during COVID, mm. that influence of visual media to tourism is even stronger now mm. than it was before COVID. Okay. So, so Booking.com wants more countries to do that, right? Well, I'm not sure that Swiss uh, fishing town is very happy necessarily with the uh, inflow of tourists, but, you know, um, that is a phenomenon. Actually, I think it's crash landing on you. Yeah? Crash landing on you, yes, table. yes, that's yeah, right. I know my kid. I, I just browse Netflix too, too often mm -hmm. at night. Uh, Ms. Montani, maybe you, you could give an example of, of, of that as well. You know, when you have a creative product, uh, it could bring a lot of more tourists. I mean, Korea is, is, is going, you know, the, the, the pop culture is going crazy right now. Everybody loves it. Thailand, I, I, I'd have to say, we saw that during one movie. There's one particular movie that's famous around the world, uh, which is Ong Bak, uh, the trilogy. If, if you could just bring us back there, did it help at that much as well to bring tourists into Thailand? Does it, does it have that big of an effect? And, and probably learning from that, uh, has Thailand learned how to maintain the hype, you know, to bring people more, uh, more people into Thailand from cultural uh, products? Okay. So, Ong Ba is uh, very, very long, long time ago. At long that time ago, yeah. Long time ago. At that time, uh, I think everyone, especially um, a man who want to act like the Dao yeah. uh, to everybody uh, learn in the class of kickboxing, yeah. and found that it's it's too difficult to be a <laughs> It's too right? tiring. I tried. It's too tiring. I, right, I, I right, couldn't right. Do. So from that time until now, uh, we have not much uh, movie that mm. could create uh, that, that kind of impact. We have only the ghost movie that uh, to uh, utilize the scary imagination. Horror of, movies, yeah. Yeah, that's the horror movie. 
the whole horror movie is like, like our selling point for the Thai movie. Mm. And uh, in the last uh, couple of weeks, we saw a new trend that we can keep the momentum uh, to attract the people come to Thailand or to know about the Thailand. Uh, we set up like uh, we call the Y series, the Boy Love series, because uh, this kind of series is can uh, they have the content and character that uh, fit to the new value of the new generation. It's about the genderless and uh, gender equality. So uh, once they can fit the the content can fit the global market uh, with with this new value, they can expand to the related business like. Uh, the brand presenter, the event, or even the tourism mm. that can expand to the new global tourists mm. that can uh, connect to the this story and then came back to Thailand and maybe can expand to another business as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. as, as we've heard uh, just from the Deputy uh, Minister of Cambodia, uh, Madame Pen said that they're looking up to Indonesia, Thailand, and Philippines as well. So Thailand is one of the more advanced in creative economy here in, in the ASEAN uh, region. So uh, what do you need to go even further uh, at this moment for Thailand? For Thailand? Yeah. yeah. Actually, I think the ASEAN is have uh, a lot of potential. And I think we face the same problem in Thailand. We got the annual budget for support. Uh. Budget is always a problem. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to see the, the presentation from Kokka, we said, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Looking at their budget? <laughs> yeah, we, we, we got a lower budget uh, compared to the value creation that we create from the creative industry. Mm. And that is, uh, I think, we face the same problem. And the second one is, like, we have many creative, but how to connect the creative people to the business model is quite difficult because we, we didn't want them to be the, like, the business man, but how to utilize that creativity to be the new business model. Mm -hmm. Because one, you want to expand your creative industry, you have okay. to understand more and more about the uh, business and also some networking, some partnerships, mm -hmm. some, so uh, we try to uh, launch the, the, this kind of program to uplift the skill. Okay. Yeah. Same question to Badoni. If we want to advance our creative sector to you know, uh, contribute more to tourism, what does Indonesia need right now? Actually, now Indonesia is more focusing on the destination development. Okay. We are in the good timing, in the good time, since the collaboration between uh, the Minister of Public Works and Housing, mm. the Ministry of uh, Tourism and Creative Economics, and also with the Injuni. Uh, we are now trying to develop many destinations. In Bali, now we're developing the uh, uh, medical and wellness destination. Mm. We have collaboration with the Mayo Clinic and 20 aesthetic clinic from Korea. Oh. Yes, and also we are uh, we, we collaborate with the fertility clinics from uh, Malaysia, mm. wellness from Thailand also. So this is one of the big projects for Indonesia to bring the, to the next level of our tourism. Mm. It's not only the culture and uh, uh, nature, but mm. we also now Health improve tourism. our uh, quality of destination since we also learn from the, from the Thailand. Mm. We, we understand that numbers of visitors to Thailand and, and, and to Indonesia is the, the, the difference is very high. Mm. Currently, I think that Thailand is in a year the number of visitors reaches 40 million. In Indonesia, it's only like 70, 17 million. 17. So yeah. So uh, we learn from them also, like in how Thailand developed their destination. In Bangkok itself, for example, they have 60 golf course. Compared to Bali, we only have three golf course. Mm. And now we're starting to develop our destination. In, in Bali, we develop the, the medical and wellness complex. Mm. We bring the international brand just to, to, to add some more destination in Bali. More reasons to yes. come. Yes. There's, yeah. there's, there's uh, for example, the second one, like in how we now change 
our Borobudo temple to become mm. the Buddhist temple, since we understand that the market for Buddhists in Southeast Asia is very big. Mm. Now it is before that Borobudo temple is only, we are not using that as a Buddhist temple, but now we open that. We just did the Waisak in, in yeah. Borobudur. We bring, we collaboration also with the Thailand, and we bring the monk from Thailand to, to uh, uh, Jogja, to Borobudur. And now we are in the uh, discussion with the, with the travel agents, some many travel agents from Thailand. We just did the, the farm trip to Jogja, and we also opened the connectivity between Bangkok and Jogja. Mm. And we understand next, at least we can bring at least yeah, 3 million, oh. yeah, 3 oh. million visitors mm. to Jogja. Since yeah. we understand that uh, Borobudur is one of the, you know, the, the, the best, the best for, the, for the Buddhists yeah, to, to visit, to do some prayer and everything. Yeah, so for religious meditation. travels. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That's, that's the only, uh, that's also uh, something that we developed. And the other side, we see that we are also developed the, the, you know, the Mandalika. Mandalika is mm -hmm. one good example also how the government now did the collaboration between uh, the, the Minister of Public Works and Housing developed the infrastructure mm -hmm. from the airport to the, to the Mandalika uh, Special Economic Zones. Not only the, the highway, but also the infrastructure surrounding the, the complex. And in, in journey, developed the airport, the big airport, nice airport. Mm. And also we developed the hotel inside yeah. the complex. We just, uh, we developed also the circuit. We, we, we bring the MotoGP inside yeah. to promote the Mandalika. So this is that, the, the, the yeah. next level of how Indonesia manages the tourism sectors. So that, that's exactly it. When you build the Mandalika, you also bring the events. That, that's what you have to do and, and to create the whole ecosystem uh, yeah. there to make you know, even, even those who've never been there yeah. uh, comfortable to go there. So that, that's interesting from Indonesia. Now, uh, I guess we only have time to touch upon sustainability and inclusivity. So I, I'll go to Mr. Lee about this. I mentioned on how the numbers, uh, and also the, our speakers here have mentioned that it's been good after the pandemic. Um, numbers have been good. Booking.com has been working hard for the past two years, but everybody with a happy face there. But how do we keep it uh, you know, sustainable? How do we keep it inclusive? Because we have to give this, this chance to everyone. Uh, and, and probably you know, competition in, in uh, grabbing the supply is high, but how, how, what does Booking.com do to ensure this? Yeah, no, thanks for the question. I mean, uh, maybe I'll touch on uh, sustainability first. Mm -hmm. uh, I think um, during the pandemic, one of the things that uh, we, obviously, you know, everybody was very, it was very apparent, is how the uh, nature and fauna recovered uh, yeah. as a result of the footfall traffic uh, decrease. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, there was, a, there was a very popular news story about how fishes returned to the Venice canals. <laughs> yeah. um, so I think that was very instructive for us yeah. as a company. Um, so we kind of, I think we were one of the first movers on developing a sustainable, uh, a sustainability product within um, our user interface. Um, it's called the Travel Sustainable Batch. Um, mm -hmm. It was launched in 2021. Um, and the idea was to capture the sustainability investments our hotel partners were making. So things like, you know, off-grid uh, electricity generation through solar or wind, um, changing windows to be double-paned, removing single-use plastics, uh, incorporating EV charging stations within hotel garages. Mm. Um, these features, we know a lot of our hotel partners are doing, but actually many of them don't go off and get certified. Okay. Get the certifications from LED, for example, for building certification, or GSTC, Global Sustainable uh, uh, Tourism Council. So we thought, how can we help them be recognized? But I want to emphasize, we're not a certification body. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we developed this batch program. Mm. It still has a lot of room to improve, but since the day we started in 2021, um, November 2021, to date, we have about half a million properties with mm. the batch. Um, to put that in perspective, that may seem like a lot, but we have about close to 30 million listings globally. So it's still quite a long ways to go. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, as some of the speakers have alluded to since yesterday, um, sustainability is really a very big, long journey, yeah. right? And tourism is an ecosystem. 
we control and we can only influence a very small part. Yeah. Um, for example, back Donnie's uh, previous employer, the airlines, they have to do their part. Um, the, the last mile rental car uh, industry has to do their part. But for us, what we try to do is tr we try to nudge consumers and hotel partners to do better. Mm. And we offer incentives and information to help them make the best choice. Mm -hmm. So that's you know, what I'll say on sustainability. Um, in terms of inclusivity, yeah. I think um, that's a very interesting uh, question because so I think for us, you know, we kind of position booking as a catch-all. We offer everything from hostels to five-star hotels, um, and we know not every provider actually aims to do that. Yeah. So we know, you know, there are providers who aim to be exclusive. So I'm sure many travelers, you know, they book their five-star hotels from Amex Travel, for example, mm. um, and call the concierge. And then there are backpackers who only use Hostel World, for example. Mm -hmm. So I think for us, the value we provide is we want to try to provide the most choice across the full spectrum of okay. offerings. And I think that's what kind of what made us popular. Um, and we've been able to do that because, I think also because we've been around for a very long time. Mm. Uh, Booking was founded in 1996, so we've been around for more than 27 years. Um, so yeah, in, in tech years, we're considered probably ancient. <laughs> <laughs> but it's nothing like 96 anymore in 2023, no. right? So there's, no. you, you've learned a lot uh, uh, along the way. Uh, and being from 96, you've gone through a lot of uh, very dangerous years there. So uh, interesting from Booking.com. Now, uh, Mr. Anthony, uh, I'd like to ask also about sustainability and also inclusivity. Uh, we talked about the cultural heritage also that we have here in the ASEAN region. Uh, we talked about the creative industry that is, that is growing here in ASEAN, the platforms that is being used to grow that as well. But, uh, uh, we, you know, in, in the process, things tend to get left behind if we, again, put them in the back burner. There are people who are unfamiliar with the technology. There are people who do not have the access. And then it, the technology or the projects become less inclusive for them. Now, how do you keep, in Thailand, how do you keep it inclusive? The creative economy, as it grows, how do you keep it inclusive for everyone in Thailand? So uh, my, as I mentioned in the, in, uh, earlier that there's a lot of people who are the creative, from creative sector, yeah. return home. And uh, from my point of view, uh, my uh, agency try to keep this kind of people stay there. Because this kind of people who are from the creative sector, they know how to add value to the yeah. heritage culture. And they know how to uh, they have the mindset of the sustainability or like the inclusive people because once they return home, uh, we found many evidence in province in Thailand. They set up the studio for the children, uh, mostly are the art uh, studio. Uh, the art is uh, like open for everyone in the community to join in and then in the meantime, they create the products that uh, to create uh, the fair trade, like uh, we have many design products to uh, give a fair trade to the community or, or to the weaver. So that's why uh, in terms of policy, we try to keep these people to stay in the local communities mm. because now they, they can do that job any, anywhere because the technology yeah. can help them to stay. And also the delivery system is also help them to stay in the local area. Mm. So to keep them there is uh, the best way to uh, keep a uh, sustainable way and inclusive people. Mm -hmm. It keeps track and also yeah. it's uh, more reachable right. that way when they're there. Interesting uh, as well. So probably just a closing statement from everyone. Uh, what collaborations do you wish to see if we're talking about trying to advance our creative economy in the region, in our countries? Uh, and also, what do you see in the future for tourism when, it, when we're talking about building a more creative economy around the world? Uh, Padoni? Uh, I think I would like to use this opportunity to, you know, to, to uh, express my opinion about the, mm. the region, the ASEAN region. This is actually the good opportunity for us to, you know, to, to bring the tourism. It's not only like Indonesia by Indonesia and Thailand by Thailand, but we need the collaboration between the ASEAN countries. Mm. Like in, in Sanur, 
we develop the medical tourism. We bring two good brands from the Asian countries, from the Malaysia and also from the Thailand. Mm. That's, I think that's also an uh, opportunity for Indonesia brand to exist in, the, in all Asian countries. That's the first one. The second one is the connectivity between these countries. I think we need to improve how, mm. how we, we see this, this region as a as a, you know, as a seamless connectivity. Yeah. Like, like today we want to open the Yogyakarta to Bangkok, Yogyakarta to Cambodia, and, and vice versa. Mm. I think this is the next level of the, the, the Asian countries. We should go together to, you know, to, to see the opportunity to increase our tourism industry and our creative industry. Then I think, I believe that in the future that, that, that would be happen if we, if, if we can work together to, you know, to bring this and, and, and also penetrate the same market together. Mm. This is like, like, you know, we are very close to each other. Yeah. When people come to, to Kuala Lumpur, for example, it's easier for them to fly to, you know, to Danau Toba. It's yeah, very yeah, close. Very close. Yeah. And, and, and also, uh, if, like, like, if people come to Thailand, it's also they, they can come to, to Bali, so we can create the package between Indonesia and, and Thailand and something, something like that. So the next level, I think it's, it's good for the association, yeah? like, like the Association for Tourism in Indonesia and Thailand and all the Asian countries. We work together how to bring the, Indonesia, the Asian tourism and creative, and, and creative economy to the next level. That's, that's, that's from my point of view. Okay, collaboration, uh, you know, when the borders aren't there, it's so easy to interact, yeah. so easy uh, to, to build something together. Interesting point, Padoni, thank you. Uh, Mr. Lee, what would your closing statement be about this? Yes, so I think, um, you know, there's strong, obviously, uh, socio-political, macroeconomic challenges uh, that's been mentioned uh, already. Um, but I think one fundamental truth that we've seen post-COVID is people will travel and they yeah. love to travel. That is not gonna change. Um, and I think for us as a company, we focus in doubling down on our philosophy of the three Ps, people, planet, and profit. Um, triple bottom line, I think everybody's familiar, but I think it couldn't be more apt uh, mm. now, um, given the focus of sustainability. I think from our perspective, we wanna continue to work with governments to focus on a couple things related to sustainability and tourism. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot to be done there, but tourism sustainability is complicated. Mm -hmm. It's complex because it's a big ecosystem. It's not like a uh, you know, producer like Apple, for example, yeah. which controls their whole supply chain. Yeah. Um, we can only influence the airlines so much. We can only influence the hotel uh, partners so, uh, in so far. Mm. So we need government to step in to help. Um, I think one concrete policy I can share with you that has worked quite well in the housing space is um, in many cities across the world, but I'll just use one from uh, San Francisco, um, the government incentivizes developers to produce social low-income housing with access to uh, uh, zero interest long-term loans. Mm. So basically what they're saying is, is we will reward you to build bigger and better and more if you provide a social service mm. while you do it. I think you can absolutely do that with sustainability. You can provide that incentive to build new hotels, new developments that have sustainable elements yeah. and you get access to more capital. Yeah. So I think you have to make that kind of access to capital pathway smoother and faster. Um, and then I think the developers will come. I think that's easier to do than legislating yeah, yeah. and requirements. Yeah. That's always harder to do. Low cost as well, right? Yeah. Why that way? Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Lee. Ms. Montini, what's next for the creative economy in Thailand? What do you say exciting next? Yeah, uh, among the ASEAN, apart from the FTA, we, think, we talk about trade and mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the products and labor. But why don't we can collaborate in terms of artists and creative people that can uh, free flow among the ASEAN yeah. because this, uh, the artists, I heard that uh, our artists go to Boroputo to do like a um, lighting festival there, to do oh. a lighting festival there. So if we can enhance these artists and uh, creative people to free flow among the ASEAN, they mm. can go to collaborate with the local communities and also like uh, the, some destination, they can create some attraction or new perspective of that destination. Yeah. So if we can collaborate among the ASEAN, we can have like the new tourist destination yeah. every year from uh, artists in ASEAN. 
So that's why I think it's, I, I don't know that we have a infrastructure to support them now or not, mm -hmm. but I think it would be a positive way to do it. And I think it could be do it without like, uh, we can just uh, adjust the regulation yeah. or something. It's not uh, to do, to invest much in, in, in this. Uh, interesting point as well, Ms. Montini. I guess that also adds up to, to um, trying to just bring down the borders and anything that's, that's hindering us from working together, I guess. Mm -hmm. so, so artists moving from one country, yes. from one ASEAN country to another, an ease of travel between these countries, right, right. Uh, an ease of actually you know, uh, meeting a network uh, uh, base uh, between artists in, in this uh, region. I think that could do a lot. Borders, um, yes. technology would also help bring down a lot of borders there. But then again, travel, uh, we need easier ways to be traveling among ASEAN and Indo-Pacific countries. So there's a lot of room for regulation. There's a lot of room for collaboration as well here. Uh, and a lot of room for deregulation. I, I guess that's the word, not regulation, but deregulation. Uh, but there's a lot of aspects to that as well. But I see the energy there uh, in ASEAN. and, and I'm. I'm sure that with the youth of ASEAN, the big population of youth in, in ASEAN, they expect that as well. Now, creative economy, uh, I expect to see a lot more exciting stuff from ASEAN coming up in the following years. We've seen a lot of growth in creative economy from a lot of countries, Indonesia as well, uh, taking the world stage as well. So let's hope that that also attracts more and more people within the region, ASEAN and Indo-Pacific. Thank you so much for your insights. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause to Padoni, Mr. Lee, and also Ms. Montini. Thank you for your insights. Thank and you. we'll hope to see you again, maybe in another city in ASEAN as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dave. Thanks again. Once again, we'd like to thank our moderator and also our esteemed speakers today for that. Once again, a very lively and insightful session. Ladies and gentlemen, after listening to the panelists today, sharing their insights, their experiences, we will now continue with the next session. Now, before moving on to the next fireside chat, ladies and gentlemen, again at the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum, implementation of ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Ladies and gentlemen, today together at Ballroom 3, we are here gathered to discuss more about creative economy. But we do hope that all of you today, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, have also had the chance to exchange ideas about the other two major topics or issues being discussed. As one of the first is green infrastructure and also resilient supply chains. Now speaking about sustainability, ladies and gentlemen, that seems to be one of the words being spoken a lot about today. We hope and we are aiming to explore ways to foster green and sustainable infrastructure development and also ways to fortify supply chains against global disruptions. And also another major issue being spoken and discussed here at the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum. Again, sustainable and innovative financing. Where this sub-theme also aims to discuss efforts how to mobilize funds for green initiatives and accelerate sustainable development as well as connectivity in the Indo-Pacific region. And now, ladies and gentlemen, of course, we will continue. Let's transition to our next agenda for the day. We will have another fireside chat. And with that, get ready for another engaging session that promises to enlighten and inspire all of you today. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator, the managing partner of Vietnam Office, McKinsey, Mr. Bruce Delte, and also our esteemed speaker, the CEO of FPT Smart Cloud, Mr. Le Hong Viet. A round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, good, good afternoon. Can you, everyone can hear me? All good? Okay, good. Very good. So my name is, is Bruce Delta, and as mentioned, I, I live in Vietnam. Uh, I'm the managing partner of McKinsey there. 
And um, this CEO of Fireside Chat is to hear uh, a little bit more about what it takes to, to take a digital product idea or vision, make it a reality, uh, and then sustainably grow a business related to it. So very happy today because we have um, Mr. Mr. Viet, Mr. Le Hoang Viet, who came from Vietnam as well uh, yesterday to be with us, um, and who is the CEO of one of the largest subsidiaries within FPT, and FPT being uh, the unrivaled technology player in Vietnam and also involved in a number of countries outside Vietnam. So thanks, thanks very much. Thank you, Bruce, and uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Hope you enjoyed the event today, right? <laughs> so I think we should, we should probably start by introducing FPT a little bit. So if you could tell us uh, a bit more about the group, uh, quick words about the last 35 years, mm -hmm. and then where the group is today, and in particular, um, FPT Smart Cloud right. that you are heading. Yeah. So FPT is like uh, one of the large, uh, it's the definitely the largest IT company in Vietnam. We, uh, we founded in 1988, uh, and surprisingly, at that time, there is no corporate law yet in Vietnam. So one of the very first companies established in Vietnam after the, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, renewal of the, of the economy. And uh, uh, at the beginning, we, we already identified innovation and technology is the key uh, cornerstones for our company to be uh, successful. And, uh, and actually, at the very beginning, we start with food. That's why it's FPT, Food Processing Technology. Right. And, uh, um, after two years, we pivot into IT, and um, and uh, from 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 that time, we built uh, I think most of the uh, largest IT systems in Vietnam for for the government, for uh, uh, financial institutions, and uh, and and uh, reach out to the community as well. And uh, uh, in 2000, uh, the year 2000, uh, we uh, our father decided to go global, and uh, we. We uh, extend our business to uh, develop, develop countries like U.S., like Japan, and provide IT services to, uh, to this company. And uh, right now, we, uh, APT is uh, f around $4 billion U.S. Dollar, dollar in terms of revenue, and we're operating in uh, 29 countries uh, in uh, three main areas. First one in technologies, uh, second one is uh, telecommunication, uh, mostly in Vietnam, and uh, the first one is on um, uh, edu educations, uh, where uh, we right now having around 160,000 students uh, in our education systems, and uh, in, in in total, FT is serving around uh, 56 million Vietnamese uh, people uh, through our solutions, and uh, around 600,000. Uh, and uh, SME uh, enterprises and SMEs in Vietnam through through our uh, uh, products, uh, creative products, of course. And um, uh, talking about FPT Smart Cloud, then yep. uh, we are the uh, number eight subsid subsidiary in in FPT, mm -hmm. and uh, our mission is to uh, accelerate the digital transformation through uh, key uh, technologies. And uh, we we've been working actively in three main uh, technologies these days. Uh, the first one is um, cloud, of course, as a, as a foundation for all IT systems coming into the future. The second one is data, when you, you capitalize on the data. And the third one is AI, when how can we automate things, how can we serve, increase the productivity, and how can we increase customer experience through these technologies. Okay, thank you, thank you. So let's get into the, the core of our talk, right? Because you've explained that FPT uh, embarked on every new wave of innovation until what you're doing today, which is really, you've got the AI platform in place and so on. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit on what it takes to actually get to that initial intent, right? To embark on a new wave of innovation and actually make it happen? Mm -hmm. Because I think that would be very valuable for a lot of players and, uh, and to understand actually how you've done it at FPT. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, uh, the most important thing is the vision. How can we uh, how can we imagine about the, the new world? Right. And APT is always looking forward to, uh, to, to, to into the futures, and, uh, and, and, and the leaders of APT group also have uh, strong passion in innovating technologies and bringing those technologies to serving for uh, common goods. Mm. So uh, the desire and the, and the vision of the uh, 
uh, of the leadership team is one of the very, very key uh, area. And the second one is definitely the people. Uh, in APT, we, uh, we motivate uh, people to be creative and to, be, uh, to have ownership of what they have been doing. So, for example, our, our company is established when we uh, was a small uh, R&D team in, inside APT Corporation, and uh, we uh, have freedom and we have uh, people, creative people, to, 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 to conduct R&D, and then, and then uh, we can build a product. Uh, but that's the very initial phase. The, the, the most important thing is how can we bring it into life? How can we find the right use cases for, for these products? Because the product is just a product. If you don't bring it into life, it will, it will die. So uh, uh, working very closely with uh, the community and with the customer will, will help us to uh, identify the right pain points. Uh, the, and, then, and then our products will be very much focused on these pain points. So uh, I can share you a story. For example, uh, we, we, we have a very interesting story right before COVID. Uh, we uh, incubated an AI product uh, to automatic engage, engagement with, to, uh, with, with, with users. Uh, first, uh, we, we provide to financial industry uh, to, uh, to, to have improving the quality of the, uh, of the uh, contact centers, uh, automating uh, the human conversations between uh, the, the contact centers and uh, the, the end users and, and the business. And then uh, COVID happened, right? Uh, so we pivot uh, very quickly to bring it to the government. Uh, at that time, we, um, we have a lot of people having COVID in Vietnam uh, and have potentially having COVID in Vietnam. And then the government need to have a way to uh, control uh, precisely who are uh, infected and who are not. Right. And we, uh, we turn our contact center into a a giant uh, uh, COVID uh, survey, uh, surveillance systems, right? So we call to every individual uh, uh, seasons, and we ask about the symptoms, and then we uh, provide automatic advice for them how to, how to respond to these symptoms. And, um, and then we also having the uh, income inbound contact center for the government. Uh, when they need help, they call in. Before, before applying these technologies, then it's the it's like overflow of the contact center. No, nobody is pick up, picking up the calls. Right. But when we introduce the, uh, the, the new contact center in, uh, automatically um, the system pick up the call and then uh, qualify the, all of the, uh, the in, inbound calls. And who really need help, then we redirect it to the right people. So it's helped a lot for the, uh, for the campaigns in Vietnam. Okay. So as a quick summary from that genesis into, into a product, you, you mentioned three things, right? You mentioned uh, encouraging people to be creative, mm -hmm. right? Number two, I think there was the part related to um, meeting of minds, you know, and the stakeholders right. talking to yeah. each other, and then eventually getting there and then improving along the way, right? Mm -hmm. Now, in a new phase of development, like, you know, everybody talks about Gen AI today, right? Where you have to make choices. Uh, between what use cases I'm going to go for, uh, what first step should I take moving forward? How do you go about filtering this? So uh, uh, I think uh, safety first, always safety first. So we, we, uh, we need to identify the use cases. That's, uh, we can control the, the, the quality of the answers. Uh, for example, we go first with uh, uh, financial industry because everything is very clear mm -hmm. uh, based on uh, uh, the numbers and and and, and uh, 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 of the policies as they, they already have. Uh, so uh, and then uh, we uh, go to um, uh, creative industry as well. Right. Uh, Zen, Zen AI is very well uh, performing in uh, creativities, and it's no harm. Thus, you are you are creating something special. Uh, but uh, we are more skeps uh, skeptical in uh, in healthcare because this uh, this can affect uh, people severely uh, if the answer is, is providing in in a in a not not a property uh, proper way. So uh, uh, we 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 qualify it based on the safety to the 
operation and to the people. And then uh, we uh, provide the measure to control the, 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 the result as well. Right, yeah. okay. So uh, you, you touched a little bit before with the COVID example in the relationship and also the cooperation that FPT may have with uh, governments and um, uh, non-private entities, right? Uh, and digital inequality is probably one of the challenges that we're facing in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. uh, and then obviously, as you said, innovation and uh, turning it into action works if the majority of people can actually benefit from it. So perhaps you can tell us a little bit on how you see your mission, right, as a, as a private technology company and how you interact with perhaps a non-profit or government mm -hmm. to overcome that um, digital inequality challenge? Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, the uh, most challenge for uh, uh, digital in, uh, equality is uh, the, the, the people and the, uh, uh, the provinces, uh, they need uh, to have a, a, a better way to uh, invest in technologies. We, we all know that technology can assist people quite a lot, and especially with uh, less advantaged people. Right. Uh, so uh, the, the way that APT is approaching is uh, we work very closely with local government, the provinces, and uh, we uh, do have a program to co-invest uh, with, uh, with the local government. So APT is investing first, and then we uh, work with the local, local government to bring the solution into life. And from, from our experience, it is always uh, more successful when you uh, have a collaboration with uh, the less, uh, the, 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 the provinces at in the bottom of the list, because they uh, really have a great Im Im ambition to, to bring good life to the people living there, but they don't have the economic uh, uh, advantage to do that. Right. So uh, when technology is coming in, they, will, they find out that it's a new uh, tools for them to, to develop the, uh, the people there. So uh, uh, we bring in the uh, technologies, uh, and then uh, after that, we bring in the education system as well. So, yeah, well, I was about to get into that. Is that also through that channel that you, you find talent, perhaps, or where the FPT University comes in, mm -hmm. or you build capabilities on the ground mm -hmm. as well, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, because we, we are right now have 160k uh, thousand uh, students right. in our, our list, so we spread out in the country, and everywhere we go to, in in Vietnam, we go in between both education and software park together. So we, we provide uh, uh, education from K-12 and university in that province. And then we build the software park beside that uh, university so that the student graduate, graduated from the university can go directly into the software park and then uh, they can uh, provide their knowledge, their creativity, their innovation to uh, uh, all over the world. Okay, yeah. and so this is a bit of the formula, right, that FPT is, do, is, uh, mm -hmm. is taking and doing and implementing in Vietnam. Uh, now, and perhaps as a way of getting into a conclusion as well, if we start thinking from an ASEAN perspective, mm -hmm. do you think that would be the right approach across ASEAN? Yes, uh, I think we, we do have the uh, right approach. Uh, we, we do see that the right approach yeah. uh, across Asia because FPT is uh, also extending to uh, Asian countries uh, here in Jakarta as well. We have uh, our business here, and and we do see that the education and the uh, creative uh, innovation technologies uh, need to go hand in hand. Uh, the formula may be different, uh, a little bit different. Uh, it can come uh, in Vietnam. We built our own university. Uh, here, uh, we can collaborate with many local com uh, um, universities here as well. Uh, so we built our uh, local capability here in Jakarta, in, in, in Indonesia, and then we're cooperating with um, local universities in order to, to bring it to, uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the world when we, through our uh, business uh, uh, partners around the world. Yeah. I see, okay. And maybe one last, one last question is, what do you think will be the, the biggest challenge over the next three to five years? Maybe for FPT, you know, or related to the discussion we had on, 
overcoming the technology challenge from an ASEAN perspective? So I, I think the, um, the technology right now is changing very fast. So uh, the, for me, the most challenge will be we are not acting fast enough in response to these technologies. So for example, if, if we are not uh, applying AI properly, then we, if we are not uh, fast enough in, in uh, using AI into the right use cases, then we will fall much behind. Uh, AI definitely can increase productivity. And what is exactly what ASEAN need, right? Um, so uh, in, taking the advantage of the current change in technology uh, is the key success factors uh, for, for Asian countries, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Well, th thank you very much. I think we may be getting uh, running over a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but thank you. That was, uh, you. That, was uh, that was a great exchange, a bit short, but uh, very valuable lessons from Vietnam, from FPT, on technology growth and innovation. Thank you, thank Bruce, you. and thank you so uh, thank much. You everybody. Yeah. Thank you very much once again to our moderator and our esteemed speaker for that very lively fireside chat. Once again, thank you very much for sharing with us and making that conversation was truly exceptional. Ladies and gentlemen, still at the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023, implementation of ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. We hope that you have enjoyed the previous sessions and also had the opportunity to engage in valuable conversations and also had the time to network with each other. We are now very excited to continue our journey of knowledge sharing and collaboration. But again, we'd like to thank all of you for still being part of our event today. And we'd like to invite all of you also to rekindle our enthusiasm and focus as we're about to dwell in the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, we all know that this forum aims to unlock further opportunities and how we can find ways to build stronger connectivity between ASEAN countries and the Indo-Pacific and find ways to promote collaboration in the Indo-Pacific itself. Knowing that this forum has invited 88 speakers gathered around 2,500 participants from 51 countries. And so, ladies and gentlemen, up next, we will together gather here for our exciting panel session, which will be titled Funding and Opportunities in Movies and Digital Products. And we will have our moderator and also our list of speakers today who hopefully will shed the light and also share their experiences, their insights on this topic. Again, speaking together on this creative economy at this Ballroom 3. Soon after this, we will still have another panel discussion and also another briefer session before having to close this event this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the stage our distinguished moderator for this discussion is none other than Mr. Lynn Newman, the Managing Director of Amcham Indonesia. And joining us as our esteemed speakers are Mr. Mike Wiluan, CEO of Infinite Studios Nong Sabatam. And we'd like to also invite Mr. Ruben Hatari, Director of Public Policy Southeast Asia of Netflix and Mr. Chaitanya Divan, Head of Content Acquisition, Prime Video, Southeast Asia. And to our moderator, we give the stage to you. Microphone live, can I be heard? I guess so, okay. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm quite um, honored to be at this uh, session and to be asked to moderate a discussion. Um, we have with us three panelists who are um, quite uh, distinguished and active in the field of uh, film production. Uh, I'll start by uh, mentioning, I guess we'll start from my immediate left, Mike Waluan, who is uh, one of the leading figures in uh, Indonesian film production and studio work, animation, and other things. He is the CEO of Infinite Studios and uh, Nongsa Digital Park uh, up in Batam. 
and a very leading, a leading uh, player in, uh, in the industry here. In addition, we have my old friend Ruben Hatari, who is uh, the director of public policy for Netflix, uh, Indonesian, of course, but based now in Singapore for Netflix. And in addition, we have Chaitanya Devan, head of content acquisition for Amazon Prime Video in Southeast Asia. Um, gentlemen, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to start, if I may, with a, sort of a general question, but that has a lot of components to it. Um, and it's a conversation that we have in Indonesia frequently, uh, and I don't think we've quite worked it all out yet. But I'd like to give each of you an opportunity, maybe, to discuss what does it take to create a roadmap and a, a climate, and a positive investment climate for the growth of um, film production in this region. But also, we're all active in Indonesia, so I think it's worth talking about that. Some, some countries in ASEAN are more successful than others in this field. So maybe we'll start with uh, Chaitanya and then work our way this way, give each of you an opportunity to tell us what your ideal roadmap would consist of and what, what we need to do to unlock uh, funding and, and other, other aspects of film production in the region and even in Indonesia. Sure, thank you Chitanya. for that, Lynn. Uh, the way I like to think about this is there is a value chain in the media business, right? And what is the value chain here in video entertainment? It really starts with content creators, and we know that that is already a flourishing uh, ecosystem. There are a lot of ideas out there. These content creators now have access to some of the tools that enable them to create, easily create uh, audiovisual content. Uh, and then after the creators come, uh, the, the services that bring together all this content in a form and format that can be consumed easily. So whether that's streaming services like Prime Video or whether it's the TV channels out there, they are really the second part of that value chain. And then you move to the distributors who are in a position to take these services to uh, the end consumers. And of course, the value chain ends with the customers who are, who are uh, engaging with this content. And and the way to think about it is, for each part of this value chain, what is the ideal uh, number of players? What is the size of that uh, part of the value chain? And what are the specific needs in that step of the value chain? right? And what can we do to strengthen every step of this value chain? Because ultimately, the strength of any chain is really equal to the strength of its weakest link. And if we are able to strengthen each part, then that ecosystem can flourish to create the kind of content and creative economy that we require. Ruben? Cool. Um, thanks for the question. It, it's kind of hard trying to think about a roadmap for the creative sector because, you know, being creative, we don't really plan on roadmaps. Um, but, you know, I think. You know, Netflix, we, we have been around in Southeast Asia since 2016, and we have seen tremendous opportunities here in Southeast Asia in terms of, you know, the local content that we could potentially bring internationally, not across in the countries where we operate, but not across the region, but, you know, globally, right? So um, I think bringing some sort of a framework where, you know, we do have a clear plan on to grow the, the, the local film industry is very much needed, and I know many governments across the region is looking at this, um, this, this plan or the, the roadmaps very, very seriously. But, but if I have to kind of look in, you know, four maybe four specific areas where, where I think, um, you know, we can really deep dive and spend a lot of time collectively, I, I think one is that uh, investing in the human resources in the film industry, right? I think that's, that's very much needed. And I, and I see this uh, very much across the region where, um, you know, the, the stories are there, but, you know, you often go to movies here in, in Indonesia and, and the talent pool, whether it's above the line or below the line, 
you know, we're tapping into the same resources over and over, and I think Mike will speak more about this uh, later on as well. Um, so I think kind of growing, growing that, um, that human resources, you know, not only quantity but quality as well, I think that's very much needed. I think number two, um, you know, how do we actually bring more investment to this industry, right? I, I think many don't under, you know, many governments are still grappling with the idea that creative economy has a massive spillover effect on other industries as well, right? And, and sometimes the spillover effect is not as direct as conventional industries, uh, but it's there nevertheless, right? So it's like, how do we actually convince governments to think about you know, developing incentives to actually bring more investments into, you know, our sector. And, you know, I think that will further kind of uh, spur the growth on uh, for definitely for this industry. I think third is around, uh, unfortunately, there's, um, there's a lot of overlapping and regulations as well in this sector. Uh, again, I, when, I'm, when I'm thinking about Indonesia, is a very decentralized government. Um, and when you do a lot of production outside of Jakarta, you know, you can think about the various layers of uh, regulations that, you know, a lot of the production houses have to actually go through in terms of seeking permits and licenses as well. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that, that we often kind of think about as well uh, is also on the infrastructure, right? Um, you know, c coming from the OTT side, Sometimes we, we, we think about infrastructure in the sense of connectivity, right? It's like, how do we actually get our services out there more accessible? Uh, but when we think about the infrastructure, it's also the hard infrastructure, like the studios, right? Um, are they there, right? I mean, I've, I've had the, the pleasure of kind of visiting some of the sets, um, that some of the production that we're doing. And, you know, when you think about kind of bringing foreign investments, you know, that kind of level of investment on the infrastructures need also need to also be, um, you know, um, pumped up as well, right? So I'll park my, my answers there, but I think those are the four areas that I'm happy to kind of go deeper later. Great. Mike? Thank you, and I think uh, certainly it's a, it's a very broad question with, with a lot of uh, insight and uh, discussion. Maybe uh, my insight obviously is from uh, a creative and uh, producing practitioner in Indonesia, and just a little about what I've been doing uh, over the, you know, 20 years ago, I started Indonesia's first animation studio. Um, and I remember um, when we first started to, you know, develop the studio, uh, we needed a, a, a roadmap or a vision of some kind, but we just understood that there was a need to digitize the industry, there was uh, the Indonesia is so creative and is so resourceful and that's so much potential. So we knew there was an opportunity to to capitalize on Indonesia's natural talent. We started off with uh, ten employees and uh, we've gone up to now uh, close to five hundred uh, animators. And over the last twenty years, have cycled through many thousand local animators who have then set up their own. In, uh, you know, studios all over Indonesia, and today we have dozens of studios across Indonesia producing very good content. And I remember when we first started producing the content, there was very little chance to get the opportunity to work with major studios, um, and we had to prove ourselves. And uh, over the last couple of years, uh, the first couple of years were really tough, not just promoting ourselves as a studio that were able was able to produce great content, but um, Internally as well, to see the involvement and focus of how the market and the, the resources reacted. I remember when we first started hiring our first animators, I had to ask their parents' permission to, to hire them because they didn't believe that their kids would have a future in the industry where they would go and play with cartoons and draw, right? And they just felt it was a waste of their time and that, you know, in two years they would come back and work for another industry that was more certain. So I had to uh, do these seminars for parents and, uh, and, and, and sort of like tell these parents that, look, there is a future in this industry and that, you know, your kids are gonna, gonna make money, they're gonna have a good salary, and they're gonna be upskilled, and they're gonna be relevant for the future. And I remember going through those seminars thinking, 
how many more seminars am I going to have to do this to grow this industry? And in, in no time at all, um, you know, we've, we, we managed now to, uh, you know, do a lot of good business and now have a very big resource of great talent. But just going back to, that's just an analogy of how internally we've evolved in terms of the industry. But just in, as a whole, the, the creative industries, uh, like my esteemed uh, colleagues here have mentioned that it's a huge business and it's not just uh, actors and producers, right? It's a whole ecosystem of, uh, there's, there's the crews, there's the creativity, there's the writers, there's the directors, there's the equipment, there's the locations, there's the, um, you know, there's the, the, the TV studios who support, there's the, the OTTs that are involved. It employs hundreds and thousands of, uh, of uh, uh, like, there's a lot of employment and benefit to tourism, to the economy, for films that come into Indonesia that are made. Um, and when we talk about the reference to, like a lot of, lot, of, lot of people talk about the K Korean wave, the Korean wave that has swept the world and how the industry has really ignited um, not just the promotion of Korean culture around the world, but the Korean film industry, right, it has really ignited um, and has found distribution and huge market and appreciation elsewhere. So we, we kind of feel that ultimately Indonesia has that massive potential, not just domestically, but for us to be able to export content internationally. Now, a couple of years ago, uh, you may remember uh, that there's been a few films that have been made that uh, like The Raid and uh, that ignited this huge renaissance in action genre in Indonesia. And after that, there's been a quite a few movies that have been made with Indonesian talents that have found a huge following and market. I mean, I've been involved in some of those movies and I've really seen this renaissance take off and now these guys are actors and producers, they're, in, they're working in Hollywood, they're working in Europe, they're right. working elsewhere and we're really proud but I think one thing is missing that I think definitely Rubens pointed out that, you know, I think there needs to be a lot more fixing and government engagement and collaboration. Engagement in ASEAN, obviously, with ways in which there are uh, more formulaic structures in which we're able to find financing and grow each other's industries. Um, you know, the, the, and, and also the, the creative industries, like there's a lot of great, collaboration that's going, that's happening on ground level, like co-producers, uh, co-collaborators are happening uh, between Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam. We see it happening all the time. But what we'd love to see is that happening on a G2G level as well, right? More platforms for us to be able to promote and cross-promote and cross-pollinate. And, and let me add just one more point then on this. I'm just very conscious of not overstepping my, uh, my, my we, time we here as time. well. So, okay. so, but also what we're seeing in the market is um, more what OTT has done. OTT has enabled markets to slightly homogenize in that sense. You know, I think Southeast Asia has been incredibly, you know, a fractured, traditionally a fractured marketplace with so many diverse uh, languages, ethnicities, colloquialism. So sometimes what works really well in Indonesia won't work in Thailand, won't work in Malaysia, but there are crossovers that do work, right? I mean, we've seen the success of Korean content, uh, Bollywood, uh, Thai horror, uh, Korean films, just really, and t Japanese films, right? I mean, we've, we've seen them move across borders now more easily, and I, ben and I, and I say it's thanks to this, the, the OTT uh, uh, players that have come in to, to, the, uh, to the industry and have allowed more distribution potential for our content. So that's more opportunity that, that helps us grow the industry, and that helps towards the general roadmap. Very thoughtful answers, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Going to ask some individual questions, and I'm going to start with Ruben. Um, we'd like to know more about how Netflix Asia views um, funding and investment opportunities in emerging markets, and are there any best practices from around this region or individual countries that you think could be replicated and could help be a, 
be a boost to the industry. Okay. Um, that's, a, that's a loaded question there, but let me, let me kind of take it in, in pieces as well. So um, our, our business model is, is subscription, right? And the content that you see on every single title that you see on, on our catalog um, gets acquired in two ways, right? Either we license the IP, right? You, you, you produce, you hold the IP, and we kind of license it for an X amount of, of time. Um, and based on the business negotiation, we would kind of say like, okay, this title is available in globally or in you know certain markets as well. But there is that kind of licensing model that exists, and you know when you when you Normally, if, um, if you've kind of been a, a subscriber to Netflix in the region since 2016, you know, pretty much all of our catalogs is, you know, licensed titles, right? Um, all originals as well, but not really investing in kind of local originals where it's coming from Southeast Asia. There's the other kind of uh, side of the content as well where we, we invest in the titles themselves, right? Um, and this is naturally done because, you know, there's, uh, more kind of fragmentation of more players in the industry as well in the OTT space. Um, and we have seen success when we um, invest in more and more local content, the appetite to that local content increases as well. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going back to 2016 when, when you know, you would normally watch Netflix and you go to the top 10 list, you know, as you know, that we have on our system. and um, I would say like maybe six out of seven of the top 10 would be dominated by Hollywood and K content as well. But I think if you look now, I think there's more and more kind of local content coming out of this region. Um, of course, we would love more coming out of this region, but you know, there's definitely an uptick in terms of growing appetite as well, right? So you, know, you, you, you see that there is more investment coming into local content production, whether it's coming from us, uh, or whether it's coming from other means of investments as well. Um, one of the things that we have seen, and I think this is a conversation that the larger industry have seen as well, and very specific to Indonesia, is that post-COVID, uh, theatricals recovery or rebound has been significant, and it's been <coughs> relatively fast. Maybe not to the extent where it was before, um, but it is growing rapidly, and, and the consumption of moviegoers to actually look at Indonesian titles is incredible, right? Um, I think at one point when it was first opened up, uh, you know, you're looking at a 60%, 40% local and international split, right? Uh, and, you know, some titles, uh, like such as, uh, you know, KKN and other titles as well, was clearing like 8 million tickets, right? And that is unheard of, okay? So you know that like, people just want to go out there and watch movies. Um, so there's definitely more and more kind of investments coming into this place, uh, into this definitely this, this industry as well. Right now, I think it, it is tapering off. I think local consumption is, is kind of reduced, not, definitely not as high as 60% as well, because you know, other kind of content is, is being exploded as well. But you know, in terms of investments, in terms of kind of best practices as well, um, there's a lot for us to learn from kind of our neighboring countries, right? Uh, you know, I touched on, you know, leading with incentives to potentially kind of bring more investments into, um, into, into the industry. And, you know, one of the, 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 the best practices that, that I look at, uh, that I can see in the region would probably be Thailand, right? Or Australia, right? And, and I, I, but I think what most people don't understand is like Thailand's film industry journey started a long time ago, right? They, and they, they started from something that is quite minimal as well. Like I think right now, if you're like looking at the, the new regulation that has just been passed by the Thai government, I think net-net you're looking around a 30% cash rebate, right? Um, you know, of course there's different tierings, like if you're you know, producing locally, you're producing with local talents, you're promoting uh, uh, you know, the culture and the tourism as well. It's almost like an add-on modular kind of um, uh, incentive model as well. Uh, but there is the base minimum of, of I believe, a 10% as well. And I think, I think the reality is that when almost every single country in the region is 
uh, going and promoting cash-based incentives, I think there needs to be like a compelling offering from the Indonesian government to really seriously look into this sector as well. It's like, well, what can we actually do um, to spur the growth of the industry? Um, and this is not about just kind of bringing inbound production. You know, what we really care about is like, how do we collectively grow the local industry as well? Because, you know, once you grow the local industry, I can assure you the inbound productions and the inbound investments will eventually come because there's strong talents there, there's the right infrastructure there, and, you know, by default, all of these kind of overlapping regulations that we currently see in Indonesia, one by one, it will be solved, and I can assure you. Well, one of the things, that I, I think you're absolutely right, but the, and the other thing is, how much... How do, you, how do you actually quantify the value of, say, the uh, Lord of the Rings yeah. for New Zealand? Yeah, how do you quantify even the value of Eat, Pray, Love for Bali? This is a hard thing to quantify, yeah. or, or the value of that, what was that, uh, was it Leonardo DiCaprio movie co, in Koh Phi Phi in, in, in yeah. Thailand, which, which, the beach. Yeah. yeah. I, which, I think, which created an industry based around that island. Yeah, I mean, and this is one of the things that, that is very difficult about our creative economy sector, right? And, and it's difficult because it's, uh, it's difficult, but it's doable. Let me be clear on that, right? Um, you know, when, when we talk about trying to advocate for something, you know, governments want to look at data points, right? And something that has been missing in this sector is that there's a lack of information and lack of data as well, right? And, um, you know, one of the things that, that Netflix has been doing with the local industry and, you know, with the Indonesian film board um, and, and the ministries as well is that we, we're trying, we want to try to capture uh, what is the true economic impact of the film sector as well. I mean, just as a starting point, right? And, and the way that you need to look at it is like once that you can actually capture and have a snapshot of how big the industry is, how influential the industry is and what is the spillover effect to other industries, then you can start to build up the conversation to other things as well. But until uh, you know, that study is passed and we are kind of looking to kind of passing that study around the October timeframe, um, you know, it, it, would be a, a, it would be definitely a good stepping stone for, for other kind of conversations as well. Yeah, I, I certainly agree. I'm gonna turn to Chitanya now from Prime Video, uh, another amazing platform. Tell us a little bit, you're, you're in charge of local content acquisition. Tell us what is Prime's approach to local content acquisition and what, what's your, what, are, what are your company's goals around this? Thank you for the question. Uh, one thing, the way Amazon will approach any new uh, territory, locale, is essentially try and understand what the customer needs are and then work backwards from there to define our product proposition. It is not about saying, this is Prime Video, this is the content we're good at, now let's go find an audience for it. We're always trying to work backwards from customer needs uh, to, to shape our offering. Uh, and our global learning in Prime Video, this is true in Japan, this is true in India, this is true in EU, in Latin America. The global learning is local content is what leads and defines the service. Yep. Uh, so if you go ask a Prime Video customer in Japan, what does Prime Video offer you? The answer will be very different from what the customer in India or the customer in Germany or in Brazil will tell you, right? Um, and, and that's true here as well. Uh, so if you look at our offering, of course we have our global content, we have a lot of Korean and Japanese anime and Indian content, all of that is part of the service. But a big, big part of our thrust is what we are doing with local content uh, in the region and as an example in Indonesia too. Uh, and of course the way that then operates is you cannot go in and offer two, three, five titles in a year. You need to offer enough volume to operate at scale so that customers get enough local content that they love watching consistently over a longer period of time. Um, and, and which is why it reflects in the kind of partnerships we have got. We're working with multiple content creators uh, in Indonesia to, to bring content. Earlier this year, 
we had a fantastic campaign. So during the Ramadan festival, what we did was we took eight weeks of the around the festival, and every week we had a big local content title launching, right? And and that was a very very big campaign from a marketing point of view, from a content investment point of view. and it really showed us the opportunity the size of the opportunity the potential of local content with audiences here uh, which only encourages us to double down and invest more the other important point to this i must say is we are also very excited about the ability of content to travel across regions right we are seeing korean content getting consumed across southeast asia we are seeing anime content getting consumed in the region as well uh we've started seeing some signs of say indonesian content also traveling to other markets in southeast asia uh and and what our learnings on that are is that localization of content is extremely important on day one now now there is a flip side to it there's also high levels of piracy in the region so if you are not able to offer localized content on day one if you are not able to offer content with thai dubs or or uh, malaysian subs for example if we are not able to do that then there's this skyrocketing piracy which we have to face so so to tackle that localization is important uh, of course then targeting specific customer cohorts who are who want to watch content and are open to content with subtitles or dubbing uh, that becomes part of our go to market plan as well uh, and really we are very optimistic that the kind of quality that we are now seeing emerging from indonesia we believe that we will have the kind of breakout successes that some of the other uh, the media markets have already seen uh, but yeah the local content is really a big big thrust for prime video i'm going to turn now and ask a question of 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 mike there's so many things we could ask you um but you you've really been on the cutting edge of this industry in indonesia <clears throat> and I'd like to ask you what you see coming in terms of technological transformation what are the what are the things on the horizon that are going to disrupt the industry and and how is how do you envision that playing out and how do you take advantage of it so uh after we started the animation studio we 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 and and it was more about at that time finding collaboration with uh we were introduced to HP and uh they had just uh, and Dreamworks and we were trying to look at technologies to try to apply to our animation pipeline and it was it was there was I must say there was very little interest to collaborate it was more interest to sell right like how how many computers and how many <laughs> how many servers can you buy from us right then maybe <laughs> we'll we'll see if we can help you out right but I think that's changed a lot and um and to and, and it's just, we've we've made some missteps along the way as well and i can tell you some stories that that we 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 were also the first uh we we looked at indonesia and saw that there wasn't any real studio infrastructure um and we knew that at some point technology and production meet there needs to be a good studio infrastructure to produce a certain type of content so we we were the first studios uh that we we built studios in singapore we built studios in indonesia and uh and we realized very quickly that um the industry just doesn't come if you build it right uh because it's cheaper to 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 uh, hire a set uh to to hire a house and to go sure. somewhere than to build a set in a studio um and uh we'll, we'll just shoot that Sinatron we, in Mentang exactly right? we'll just I mean. we'll just we'll just go to uh uh you know uh anchal and you know we'll 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 lose someone's backyard and you know that's that's the film industry sometimes or tv industry and you know we had these great studios that were designed and built by um hollywood standard uh, consultants and we found that there was no very little interest to use them because they were expensive to use and mm. uh and so we kind of realized really quickly that maybe we're too far ahead of the game or maybe we we kind of did a bit of a misstep here because what was that point where people would need that studio now we we started to make our own content in the studios and showed that through studio production we were able to raise the quality levels because we had controlled environments we were able to 
really sp pay more attention to performance, to visual effects, to, and we're, we, we saw that the kind of content that was created in the studios was raising the, the standards, right? Um, and, and we were happy about that. And, and in terms of technologies, we've seen technologies like motion capture uh, come and it, it was changing a lot, right? Technology was moving at a rapid pace, like from the visual effects uh, business that from the softwares, um, from even from uh, proprietary technology to desktop computing to softwares that we're able to download is, is changing rapidly. So we decided not to get involved with the rapidly evolving technologies because as soon as you buy something and install it, it's old. And everyone's looking for the latest thing. So that was the case with motion capture. We learned our mistake in building the studio maybe too soon. We built a studio in Singapore, and it, Singapore is incredibly expensive to produce content. So we've changed that model into more of the visual effects digital side, and we've done the uh, more heavy production in Indonesia. But in terms of future technology and where it's heading, we're seeing during the pandemic, there was a, obviously this lockdown. And uh, there were a lot of studios that were still in production because they have applied this virtual production technology. Um, and many of you have seen uh, Mandalorian, um, and that was used primarily using virtual production technology. Uh, it is a sci-fi, and it did allow for the makers of the content to stay in one place and use plates uh, from, you know, shot from different uh, production uh, companies to be sent, and they were able to create it in CGI and 3D, uh, and they were able to produce a very good-looking show. But it was expensive, and it was groundbreaking technology. And I believe now uh, there are more uh, virtual production technology studios that are now being applied in, in Australia, the largest now in Melbourne um, and in Korea. Um, and so we're, we're heading that way in terms of virtual production technology. We're already using LED systems to, within the studio to allow for simulated environments. And instead of green screen, we're using technologies that allow the actor to interact directly with the object, right, with, with what they're seeing. Um, of course, we're still using green screen. Um, and it's, it is really moving uh, quite quickly. And uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at applying it fully more in Indonesia in terms of the virtual production. But, but, uh, but AI is the next big thing, right? right. You know, so I mean, I, I think we'll talk about that a little bit later, but AI has been another game changer for us because AI has been able to demonstrate a certain capability. And I think as you could see in the, in the US and in our industry, there's been a lot of worry about AI taking over the jobs of, of writers and you know, on content creators. Um, and, and how that, but there's also the benefit of AI as well. There, there is a benefit to that, and we're exploring how that's able to streamline our production capabilities. But we're moving towards a digitized industry, all right? There are, there are but it doesn't mean that we lose the craft, right? Um, I think a lot of people forget that. I think the word of apprenticeship, so it's lost now, right? You know, it's, it's, uh, in this industry, it's a, it's a hundred year old industry. The creative industry is based on apprentices where they learn for many, many years to do a certain craft. And that's kind of changing more when technology comes in and is applying that new technology into this process. So um, in terms of a roadmap moving forward, we're gonna see uh, in terms of distribution of, of content, it's gonna change a lot You know, with 5G, with 6G coming on board, with you know, the connectivities into more rural areas. Um, and, uh, you know, people are just going to want more. But just in terms of capability, Indonesia has now developed a very capable uh, digital grasp on and, and new softwares and technologies like using the Epic Unreal Engine, for example. We we're using Unreal in a lot of our uh, uh, projects right now or training. Um, and what is needed now, when, when you want to grow the industry using technology, you need to upskill. You need to upskill the workforce. And this is where vocational education comes in. And it's being able to collaborate with technology developers. And that's why today we're not looking at just buying technology. We're looking to collaborate 
with the technology developers, like the LED screen mm -hmm. makers. We want to collaborate with them to how we're able to use their technology, but give feedback and how, this in, how the technology can improve. And uh, using Unreal and using all these different softwares and, and hardware to, to and collaborate and further the industry, but as well as upskilling and training. Um, we spend a lot of time training the next generation of young people, like with our collaboration with Campus Merdeka, collaboration with I Apple Academy, IBM, AWS. Um, you know, we're, we're training this young generation to be ready for the future of technology and how to apply their skills to uh, the, 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 the quick evolution that's, that's, that's happening right now. And so that's, that's the roadmap that we see in the future is training and collaborating, training up skilling and collaborating with the technology providers and, um, and keep, keep on applying that to the creative process. Well, one of the things that I was thinking about, it, some, some, you mentioned Korea. I think Ruben mentioned Korea. I was living in Korea just as the Korean wave was taking off. And this was, I was, I was, uh, this was in 2007 or 6, 7, something like that. And there was a, there is a question in here. There was a palpable sense of excitement in that society about the wave. You might have been an accountant, but you knew about it. And it was almost as if, well, Korea's a different sort of place. If you've never been there, it's quite amazing. But there was, a, there was a sense in which the government, the public, the private sector were all in it together. Yes. They really wanted to tell people about Korea. Here's this little country built on rocks with no natural resources. And they really wanted to tell their story and create something new, and they did. So I'm going to ask each of you, we've got a few minutes left, I'm going to ask each of you to think forward five years, 10 years. Where do you see the, the industry going? What's the, what's the best case outcome you can imagine? What do you hope happens five years, 10 years down the road in this region? Uh, perhaps to replicate what happened in Korea um, or some other, something else. But I don't yet, in Indonesia, I don't yet feel that intangible thing that they had in Korea. And I, I, I would love to see it. And just ask any of you, each of you, maybe start with Chaitanya, reflect on where you think this is going to go in a few years. Yeah, let, let's look at the size of the industry right now, right? Um, I, and I'll compare with what is commonly called a thriving media market, India. Uh, India has about four times the population of Indonesia. Uh, the per capita income in India is probably half of what it is in Indonesia. Uh, so just using those uh, benchmarks, you'd expect that the, the media or the video, in, in, in video industry here would probably be about half the size of India's uh, economy, the creative economy there, but it's actually a sixth, right? And, and clearly there is potential, high potential for growth if you just look at some of these macro figures. Uh, I, I, I go back to what I started with. I was talking about the whole value chain, and I'm really hoping that between all the stakeholders, from the government to the private, uh, we are able to look at the needs of the different pieces of, those, uh, of that value chain and start catering to strengthen each element of the value chain. And if we are able to do that, I think then we can fulfill the potential that exists around us here in Indonesia. Cool. Um, you know, the interesting part about the entertainment sector or the creative economy is that, you know, everyone needs to be entertained, right? Um, you know, the, the, the region is, it's a growing demographics. I mean, I think we all know the stats uh, after having kind of watched the ASEAN summit and the sideline events for the past few days. So the number speaks for itself. I think if I can, you know, think forward and kind of look through to a crystal ball, maybe to the 10, 15 years, I think uh, the consumption 
of local content is going to increase, and this is not just local content that is, you know, serving every single country in ASEAN, but I think content that is coming from Indonesia going to be consumed more in the Philippines and vice versa, but also, you know, going abroad, beyond um, the region as well, you know. I mean, and, and we have seen signals like this happening as well. I mean, you know, one of the most successful Indonesian title um, that came out of our service uh, is called The Big Four. It's an action comedy by Timo Chayanto. Um, this, this, it, was, it was heavily consumed all the way to Brazil, right? In, in like countries such as in South America, it was appearing into top tens. So, you know, we, we see the signals happening as well. Um, so I, I, I do see a lot of that happening as well. You know, what I'm hoping um, across the region as well, and I, I think this is the mindset for many industries across the region as well, is that how do you actually cross-pollinate or, you know, have greater collaboration across country? I think Mike touched on, like, co-productions between countries as well. I think where, where we need to realistically look at is that, you know, are there elements or part of the production where maybe it could be done in a certain country, like in Thailand, and some parts of it can Indonesia. So just look into the region as a massive supply chain as opposed to just one individual country. And, and I think, you know, elements like that can happen. And, and, you know, kind of going back to incentives that I touched on before that most countries will look at, you know, incentives doesn't have to be all about production, right? I mean, you know, when you look at the Australian model as well on, on, on film incentive, they have very specific incentives on post-production, right? Maybe like a country like Thailand where they excel in post-production, and the reality is that many producers do offload their load, workload to, to Thailand as well. Maybe there could be models like that as well. Indonesia is a country that has strong talents, uh, strong writers as well. Can we actually work in a model where we just look into a very specific um, you know, support where it's just very targeted on a particular function of a production. So I think some of those things, I, you know, I envision uh, this region and specifically in the film industry and the creative economy will kind of venture into. I think, I think uh, what is exciting from the industry is, is seeing that Indonesian uh, filmmakers and content creators are, you know, there's always been a very strong uh, pool of talent. Uh, in Indonesia, and it's growing. I mean, I was on a panel um, uh, earlier uh, last week where we talked about uh, the Directors Guild in Indonesia officially has 76 people, right? But actually, there are hundreds of directors in Indonesia. Right. But like, there's a culture of which if you reach like the top 10, you got work for life kind of thing, right? But there's, but there's also needs to shift towards the, the new and upcoming talent. It's just like actors, right? Um, once you're in the top 10, you're gonna be busy for a couple of years. And, um, and, and but sometimes, industry also has to force themselves to change and give chances to new and um, emerging talents. Uh, and Indonesia has tons of that, right? And so sometimes our film industry or our TV industry, we, we make too many easy bets on the same people all the time. And I think it's forcing ourselves to kind of look at, at making bets on new talents and growing that, right? Because there's just so much great talent here in terms of the filmmaking side, the performance side. Um, and what's exciting is that also now filmmakers are mining the colloquialism of Indonesia and doing very well. We're seeing uh, more and more cinemas. Uh, I mean, we always know that Indonesia has been underserviced for the for screens, right? I mean, we have one of the we have the largest uh, markets in uh, Southeast Asia, but we have probably the less screens per capita, right? And uh, per, and and it's um, and and we're seeing that grow, and we're seeing, I mean, Ruben mentioned that after the pandemic, we've seen unprecedented levels of cinema goers, right? I mean, uh, like going beyond. You know, seven, eight million. You know, I mean, I think the record before uh, pandemic was four, four million, right? So we're seeing double that. So, you know, the prediction that no one's going to go back to the theater, right? No, I mean, people love going to the movies. Sure. Right? People love going to the movies. Now we just need more screens, and and when those screens begin to go uh, online, more and more people are going to the movies. So we're, we're, what the hope is, and what we do see, the positive side is that. 
with more investment, with more infrastructure, with more screens, uh, we're going to see this very robust and domest strong domestic market going to grow. But at the same time, we're going to see this evolvement from just a colloquial market to a, a producers or creators who are going to look at distributing their content beyond shores. And we're going to see a new wave of Indonesian content that's going to go across. And we've already seen that. We just need more of that, and we're very confident that's going to happen. Well, thank you very much. I've got flashing red lights here. <laughs> I've got a sign over there that says, time's, time's up. up. <laughs> I'm afraid they're going to turn off the lights and shut down the microphones if we don't close and let everybody get on to the next event. But I want to thank you gentlemen very much for being here. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, organizers for giving us this opportunity to have this panel. And ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we'd like to thank our moderator and all of our esteemed speakers today. Thank you very much for the very insightful sessions. You may now return to your seats. And now, excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, for our next session, we will now follow another briefer session as we still have another esteemed speaker who will offer us valuable insight focus on the rise of the experience economy. So with that, please join me in giving a warm applause as he takes the stage, the Managing Director of FGBC Asia Pacific, Mr. Franck Gentil, the stage is yours. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I know it's, uh, we're reaching the end of our long sessions over the last few days, and I hope everyone's uh, still having a wonderful time and learning as much as possible. Certainly, I know that I am. So um, thank you for joining us for this last session. So the experience economy. Um, it's a radical idea of thinking about the experience economy in the reality that with the experience economy, time is the currency of value. And this is quite different. It's um, more important than volume or range or any metric. The value is the impact. So it means that we get a situation where we want to understand whether we're, having, we are spending our time well, so time well spent, or we have saved time. And that ends up with emotional reactions in the form of, I'm so happy we did this or we sure got a lot done. So it's a very different way of, of actually measuring activity. And where it becomes most powerful, as we will understand in our next speakers, is that when we create a situation of collaborating creativity with technology, we can satisfy both of those needs. And that's a unique situation. So we get an enhancing time and an elevating of time. So deeper interactions as opposed to just normal interactions and smart ways of doing things. And I think about it in terms of really practical things, the fact that we have live streaming. So rather than waiting for something to be finished, we can actually interact from the very beginning. This is a direct correlation of creativity with technology. We have immersive storytelling where we're actually part of the story. Things which may seem to be relatively fickle, um, like gamification, in fact, really gives huge entry into things like education and banking, genuine content personalization, so things which are personal. And we also have probably the most impactful component of the experience economy is monetization. So we're able to seriously, the creative people and the people in developing both the technology are able to make money out of the exercise. Where in fact, previously, they've actually been sort of sidelined. So this has impacted all of our sectors, right across from 
entertainment, finance, healthcare, and hospitality. I'm old enough to understand what it was like to interact with all of these sectors before the experience economy, and it was really difficult. It was difficult going to the doctor, it was difficult making a banking transaction, and now everything is nice and straightforward, and this is a direct correlation of saying that the experience of operating in this economy is more important than the volume and more important than the range. But by far the biggest, I suppose, result and the biggest component that we get from the experience economy is we're able to move away from the pursuit of perpetual growth, almost at times the pursuit of perpetual growth at any cost. In this situation, we're able to move away from that and start really committing to perpetual improvement. Rather than doing more, we're actually thinking about doing better. And and I think this is the huge experience economy gift that's been uh, put upon all, uh, all our sectors. And if you think about it in terms of a real metric, an old metric that we're used to, the experience economies are currently valued at 1.6, or this is prior COVID, $1.6 trillion. So it's a real exchange in terms of genuine economy. So the creative sector have become agents of solutions. We're genuinely producing things which are solving the issues at hand. So, of course, with that situation, is that with greater power comes greater responsibility. And now esteemed speakers that are going to come up stage now are going to talk about how they're committed to the perpetual improvement and advancement, but also how regulation is going to play into their obligations. Thank you very much, and please enjoy the next set of speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much once again, Mr. Franck Gentil, for your time and sharing with us today at our event. So, ladies and gentlemen, now we will move on to the last panel discussion of the day. But before we're about to invite our moderator and also our speaker today, once again, I'd like to invite all of you that in the spirit of collaboration, together at the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023, we have discussed on three major issues today, and now being at the Ballroom 3, speaking more about creative economy. And so with that, ladies and gentlemen, moving on for our next panel discussion of the day, we'd like to invite to come and join us on stage. We will be discussing further about the topic of advancing movie and audiovisual entertainment industry through better regulation. It is a pleasure for me to call upon our moderator, British Council Director, Southeast Asia and Country Director, Indonesia, Mr. Summershep, please do come and join us, and all of our speakers today. Joining us, Mr. Darren Ong, Head of Digital Services and Global Selling, International Public Policy of Amazon, Mr. Danny Wirianto, CBO of GDP Venture. And we're also delighted to have Ms. Amor Maklang, convener of Digital Pilipinas. To our moderator, we give the stage to you. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, you can. Excellent. Um, Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, or Salamat Sori and Salamat Datang. Welcome to the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum, the Creative Economy sub-theme session. So we have the last session of the day. Let's try to make it the best, shall we? Excellent. Thank you to all of you in the audience for staying with us until the very end. You must be the hardcore practitioners and policymakers in the creative economy. So I'm delighted to see some of you nodding and smiling. My name is Summer Shah. I am the British Council's Director for Southeast Asia and Country Director for Indonesia. I want to start by thanking the Indonesian government, especially Kemlu, for organizing such a stimulating and productive forum, and particularly for inviting me to moderate this session. 
You may wonder what's the connection between the British Council, my organization, and the creative economy. Well, let me tell you, as the UK's international cultural relations organization, arts and culture has been a key pillar of our work since we opened our first office here in Bandon in 1948. That's right, we're celebrating the British Council's 75th anniversary this year in Indonesia which also demonstrates our long-term commitment to building long-lasting connections through cultural exchange, which includes the development of creative economy by sharing the UK's experience and expertise and champion the international creative economy. So coming to our topic today, advancing movie, audio, visual, entertainment industry and digital product through better regulation. Let me remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that the global movie and entertainment industry was valued at almost 91 billion US dollars in 2021, and is expected to expand at a compound annual growth rate of 7.2% from 2022 to 2030. Moreover, the rising popularity of virtual and augmented reality provides audiences with new experiences and new marketing and distribution platforms such as IPTV, digital newspapers, DTH and digital cable, as well as online music and movie sales, which are expected to accelerate the industry growth. Major players have adopted strategies like regional expansions and distribution partnerships to venture into untapped markets. A number of these players, including Disney Plus and Amazon, who we have on the panel today, um, have been focusing on the production of regional content to establish a strong connection with the audience in these markets. While some other countries and regions may face global market stagnation caused by the maturing of major markets like the US and Europe, Southeast Asia region is now considered a potential region for growth, fueled by increased use of digital communication and increased demand for film, music, and digital content. So therefore, it is very fitting for us to have this discussion today to explore the regulatory environment and incentives that are needed and how collaboration between countries in the Indo-Pacific and ASEAN could enhance the production of movie and digital products and services. So joining me on the panel are the distinguished speakers from across ASEAN. To the very far left, we have Amor McLean, convener of Digital Pilipinas, as a known move -make maker across ASEAN, Amor has led cross-functional and cross-border collaborations amongst regional and national line agencies, industry leaders, academics, policymakers, and various stakeholders. Specializing in high-impact, high-risk, high-value, and highly regulated industries, Amor is a leading advocate of nascent technology adoption, renewable energy, public health, tourism, urban planning, and financial services. Welcome, Amor. Thank you. In the, thank you. In the middle, we have um, Danny Ririantel, the Chief Business Development Officer of GDP Venture and a serial entrepreneur and investor focusing in the new economy. He founded several companies such as Semut Api Colony, Meraputi Incorporated, Kachil.com, to name a few. He's an angel investor in Cascus, Carousel, Tinkerlust, and a board member of 88 Rising and Vintage Electric. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. And um, to my left, we have Darren On, Head of Digital Services and Global Selling International Public Policy from Amazon. Darren started his career in the government of Singapore, including working at the Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Trade and Industry, he then moved into the private sector and worked for two of the world's largest companies in the digital content industry, Netflix and Amazon. Welcome, Darren. So without further ado, I'm going to turn to my panel. I want us to start by examining the landscape across ASEAN, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic, which has reshaped the way we consume content. So my first question is to every panel member. 
What trends do you anticipate will have a lasting impact on the movie, digital product, audiovisual, and entertainment industry in the Indo-Pacific and ASEAN market? Can I start with you, Amor? Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, and first and foremost, I'd, I'd, I'd like to raise the fact that ASEAN truly is the hub for content creation and what I call the GNG, the gigster and the gaming community. Earlier uh, today, uh, together with uh, Papandu, we gave a talk on why does ASEAN matter? And ASEAN matters because 50 million of the documented content creators in the world, yes, there is such a thing, is in ASEAN uh, all over the world. Two million of which is in the Philippines. We love our content. No one creates and consumes content, especially content in the metaverse like Filipinos. That's the first. However, despite their palpable contribution in this new digital economy, the rights of content creators continue to be undermined and unrecognized, especially post-COVID. We've seen, um, we've seen uh, instances wherein, despite the fact that they have uh, the earning capacity, they do not have the recognition of the formal banking institutions. Uh, they do not have um, uh, the same rights that uh, regular employees have. They can't have access to loans. And this is something that we are trying to bridge. How do we bridge the hard finance and also the soft creative side? And um, in Digital Pilipinas, what we're trying to do is actually to ensure that their rights are protected and uh, making sure that they can continue to create. That's one. The second trend uh, that we hope to be able to, to do is use nascent technologies like blockchain and also um, smart contracts to uh, promote, protect, and preserve content. I don't know how many Filipinos are here, maybe with the exception perhaps of Enzo, and I take except, exception to the who perhaps is the most um, digitally active ambassador uh, in ASEAN, Ambassador Joy, who's, super, who's such a super content creator. In the Philippines, we have a national legacy called Tito, Vic, and Joey. For 40 years, they have been a national treasure on TV, creating content. And very recently, there has been a national brouhaha that revealed that apparently all of their content is not theirs. So there's this huge legal battle that actually shone the light on the fact that no matter how big you are, your content is not covered. And this is where the son of one of the progenitors of uh, this triumvirate actually took it upon himself to champion uh, the rights of content creators using nascent tech, but more on that later. So those two things, protection of their rights and using uh, frontier tech to protect, preserve, and promote. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amor, for that, um, well, I guess, healthy challenges you raised um, you know, for us to explore more later. Um, can I come to Danny now? Are there any opportunities you see in addition to the challenges? Yeah, I think like from point of view of an investor, we see like, I think like the last panelist just mentioned about like the rise of like localized content. Mm. I think like local content now has become so resonant and relevant to the market because it's like, is empowering like the local culture and also like empowering like Asian, you know? I mean, like, I think like what we do, like what we did, we invest on like a company called 88 Rising, which is bringing like Asian culture to the world. And what happened is actually like a lot of people are resonant to it. That not including only like the Asian, but it's also like, you know, all other uh, type of people that are, like in this planet that are, like really into it because they hear something new, they hear something fresh, it's not, cookie cutter anymore, you know, and it's something like new. And the way we see it, like, I think in the futures, like more and more, like, I hope like more company or more talent like 88 will rise, will appear, 
and that will create like very uh, good like I think like diversity and also like inclusivity on in terms of our uh, culture. Thank you, um, Danny. I, I really like the sound of bringing the Asian culture to the rest of the world. Yeah. And I think as uh, you know, many have mentioned that actually, you know, the center of the world or the focus of the world is moving east and south. So I think, you know, the culture is good starting point without understanding each other's culture. How can we do business together? So I think certainly we want to think more on this topic, you know, how regulations can help with that. So I'll come back to you on that. But uh, um, Darren, would you like to add to um, what has already been said? Sure, sure. Selamat sore. Salam sejahtera, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian. Good afternoon. It's great to, to be here on this stage and I want to piggyback on something which uh, Danny had mentioned. So I think if we take a step back, you'd see that there's always been talk about how the world is shrinking. But over the last few years, despite COVID, us being trapped in our homes, I feel that the world has actually shrunk a little bit more in the sense that we are also much more connected to one another digitally. And when you think of it in terms of digital entertainment, then you have content that's at your fingertips and that content comes from all over the world. Mm which is amazing. I think there's a great opportunity then for <laughs> content creators from around the world to share their content with, or with the world. Uh, great opportunity here in ASEAN. And like what Danny mentioned about uh, where new companies could be formed, what new opportunities are, the, the amazing society of content creators that we see in Philippines and elsewhere, I think there's just so much more uh, room for you to grow. But at the same time, that also means there's a lot of competition. Mm. So I think overall the pie will grow for everyone, but who gets a bigger share, how fast you're growing your share of the pie, and whether we're all taking bites from each other's slice and so on, right? we're all enjoying this and, and having the growth together, like that's, that's still very much up for debate, for competition. Uh, but I still feel it's a very rosy, positive outlook. And once you build that connection, it's, it sticks, and, and you would thirst for even more of that digital content that is being created all, everywhere. Yeah. Thanks very much, Darren. I think I want to ask a follow-up question to the panel. So given the challenges and opportunities you outlined, thinking about our topic today, how do you see the role of regulations in responding to those challenges or you know, capturing those opportunities. Do you think we should tighten the existing regulations or make it more lenient? Okay, let me Danny? start. I think like, again, from a point of view investor, we like to be clear and stable, mm. for sure. When we invest on like any region, we, we want to know like, what kind of like regulation, how we can get protected. Mm. I think like the, the, the trouble at this moment in terms of regulation, there's a regulation, but there's no eradication. A big example is a piracy. Mm. You know, I mean, there's a, maybe it's, a, it's another challenge itself to, to, to eradicate, especially with the internet. You know, I think like we can see like Amazon like show probably in YouTube or like in the piracy website. And those kind of things, it, it ruined like the creator, ruined the investor, and also like it, it ruined the ecosystem itself. Mm. Because no one win except the pirate. And I think like that's need to be taken care of it. And in terms of also like regulation, I mean like we want to be fair. Mm. I mean, we, I love Netflix, I love Amazon, I love, I love like Disney Plus, don't put me wrong. But like how company like Vue or Mola can compete with this big giant company mm. if there's no fair regulation. It's very hard for a small company from the region to grow if there's no regulation whatsoever. I mean, we talk about compare amateur again, you know, EPL. It, it's a big, big different game, different mm. skill. So I think that like, they have a need, like a clear regulation. Therefore, the investor will invest. Mm. I mean, no doubt on that. Because nobody, you know, nobody, you know, we, we see like Southeast Asia is growing, but we, we invest a lot 
in the US, we invest a lot in Europe, we invest a lot like in the region that like that the regulation is very clear. But they targeted the market where, you know, the opportunity are. You know, we invest in 88 in LA, but the market is Asian. Why we want Asian? Look at the population in the world is two thirds is Asian. Nobody focus on it. You know, and like there you go. We we just invest on it, and like it proven work. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, a in terms of a regulation, we want like something that like more stable and more clear, and fair. And also eradicate. So stability, fairness, clarity. Yeah. So um, so before I, yes, Samuel, go ahead. Do you want to add to that? Absolutely. Uh, because I look at content like assets, right? Uh, just like money, uh, whether fiat or digital, content is an asset. Mm. Um, and uh, my approach to anything of value, the future is decentralized. Content is decentralizing. Um, content creation lies in the hands not of a central body that will control it, but rather in the hands of a content creator. What we need to be able to do is enable a content creator and provide them with the requisite tools and technologies that will allow them to promote themselves, that will protect themselves, that will allow them to monetize themselves and do the exchange themselves peer to peer, okay? That is where the future ought to be. The best way to regulate is to regulate peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, where does that sound like? It sounds like a decentralized exchange, right? Um, in the same manner, where you need to look at the parallelism is in um, the central banking. Where is the movement of central banks? It's in the decentralization of assets, whether it's fiat or uh, digital assets, right? So. I feel like the question, when you asked us earlier, what is the role of regulation? Which part do you want to regulate? Is it content creation? Content creation, I assure you, I bet you my bottom rupia, that or pesos, it's going to be decentralized. Now, what other aspect? Would it, would it be in the um, area of investing in um, uh, digital assets, for example? The rights of, how do we protect them? So there's an entire um, value chain in content creation. The question is which aspect. Uh, but I think the primordial thing we have to talk about is ownership, right? Ownership, which equates to monetization. And I think the future, just like with anything of value, should be decentralized. So decentralized peer-to-peer -peer regulation, stability. Uh, that's kind of like an oxymoron, right? Uh, <laughs> but I think it's going to be peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Much like BitTorrent. But then that's for another conference altogether. <laughs> so, Darren, working for a giant player in the Centralized. industry. Centralized. <laughs> uh -huh. So how would you welcome those changes proposed by the other two panelists? And also, to add to your original question, whether... Yeah. I didn't propose it. Have... It's the trend. That's where it's going. <laughs> whether it's better to have more or less regulations yeah. and so on. I, I don't really think about it in that way, but I think I'll consider whether they are good, effective, impactful regulations mm -hmm. versus the bad ones with all the undesirable consequences. Because if, you, if there is a policy issue, there is a policy objective, you have an effective policy, then it's great. You can have 10 of those to address 10 problems, and it'll be good for everyone. Mm -hmm. It could give you the clarity, the stability that the investors want. It could yeah. give you the protections the opportunities that the creators want. So I think there is one fantastic example already mm -hmm. in ASEAN, in Indonesia. Tax is often an issue which is in the headlines. Um, and big companies naturally often then get attached to those headlines too. Mm. But if you see the experience of Southeast Asia in introducing a tax on digital services, mm. the rollout has been smooth, it has been progressive, and it has already been done in most Southeast Asian countries. Mm -hmm. Several years now, in fact, for, for some of our countries. 
I think that has given clarity to the companies. Mm. It's given the, the governments mm. an answer to the question, how do I properly, accurately, and pragmatically tax companies? So I think there is a way forward for us to find more good regulations. And mm. if we can find them, fantastic. If there are proposals for bad, <laughs> if there are proposals for regulations that are starting to look bad, then uh, I hope we can correct course and uh, look for better examples elsewhere. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so, I mean, certainly representing the, you know, the UK organization and the UK, you know, we do feel that the introduction of tax reliefs and uh, you know, offering um, talents the opportunity to thrive in the, in the UK has certainly helped us to grow the industry. So, so there's a lot of experience we can share. Um, I want to bring, sort of move us on to talk about diversity and inclusion in this part of the world. And I think some of you already allude, alluded to that. There's so much nuances. And then this region is known for its diversity in terms of culture, ethnicity, history, religion, and etc. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Darren. Living in a multicultural environment like Singapore, considering the diverse socio-cultural backgrounds and regulatory landscape of countries across the region, what is your strategy in shaping a curated content that's suitable for each consumer? Right, right. And I also recall that earlier this afternoon, her Excellency from, Cam from Cambodia yeah. talked about cultural assets being one of the three main assets that they have. And I think we, to we totally agree there's, there's fantastic, um, rich, really exciting cultural history mm. in the region. That was one of the reasons why Amazon decided to launch our Prime Video service in a number of Southeast Asian countries over the last year. So now with Indonesia, Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, they have a localized Prime Video service for them. And for each country, local content remains a key pillar. Mm. So my, my colleague Chaitanya was sharing about some examples earlier. I think even for Indonesia, there have been some fantastic local content on our service. Induk Gajah, A+, Sabtu Bersama Bapak, and many more to come. Um, Chaitanya's team is super busy <laughs> closing deals. So I, I, I find that when you have local content that speaks to local customers, mm. it can not only help to grow that, that content, but also with a global service like ours and many other um, esteemed companies here, there's the opportunity for, for content to start to be shown, be uh, loved by, by audiences elsewhere. So the, the customer, a customer in, in Brazil may actually have the same taste profile as, as I do. It, it could, there could well be this person in, in Brazil or in, in many other places that also likes like, the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, mm. that is too scared to watch the really scary Indonesian horror movies, which, of which there are many fantastic ones, uh, because we're not so different in terms of our taste profiles around the world. So when you have, fortunately, scale, that means you also have the opportunity for... Um, op for penetration, and you pass it on to the creators. Yeah. Thank you, um, Darren. Um, Danny, I want to come to you on this as well, because you, you, the, your company, GTP Venture, is renowned for fostering innovation and growth within the industry. So how can companies like yours have a strategy to enable the content producers to come up with content that has global resonance while preserving their diverse cultural identities within the region? Well, to be honest with you, we're not the expert on the entertainment. We, we just can read, maybe can we just read the pattern, what's going to happen next. And so what, what happened is like we basically invest in the founder that has a vision that like, like focus on the global reach from Asian country or Asian founders mm -hmm. that like want to, 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 to show the world that like their talents. And I think uh, we also like, uh, like the idea about like a cross-border production. 
in the sense of it. So they don't see a limit because it is global, right? And when we talk mm. about global, we can like doing the production in 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 London or like in Stockholm and by the singer of like Indonesian, but also like the writer from from other country, mm. you know. And those cross-border uh, production or creation that like actually help to to introduce the culture, to help to introduce the uh, the different tastes of like part of region. I mean, I think like uh, it's happened also like in TV commercial, for example, a lot of Indonesian like they they fly to Thailand, to Bangkok to doing the like uh, post-production because they got the best one. Mm. I mean, I think like Amar talk about digital creator. Uh, the one thing that we noticed that like, there's a lot of talent gap here mm. in Asia. There's one country really good at post-production, one country really good at like, you know, creating uh, like movie directing or like music, you know, singer, but like the other country really good at, you know, scripting. I mean, like, there's not, I don't think it's like in Asian, there's like a country that like have a fully, like the whole ecosystem, like United mm -hmm. States. Mm -mm. You know, it, it take time. I think like back to regulation, I think what I want to add it, I think the government need to like focus on the talent, like, you know, invest on the talent. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the work within like uh, the government, the business, the academy, uh, the community, and also like the, 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 the creator is like need to be synergy. Mm. Because if not, it will not happening. I, w I absolutely agree with that. And I think that's a running theme across this whole forum about that regional and global cooperation and collaboration, you know, that will enable and empower the talents that we have across the different countries in this part of the world. Um, so Amor, maybe you know, I can ask you to add to that, what kind of initiatives and you know, um, ideas you would propose to enhance that connectivity and collaboration, both regionally and globally? So for one thing, um, we look at technology. Uh, so my, my, uh, my slip is showing, my slip is primarily in FinTech. And we look at fintech as a horizontal and not as a vertical. Our main objective is to embed it across various industries. That is our hope for culture. And the one industry that we hope to actually give life to using fintech is culture. Mm -hmm. And in the Philippines, we are going to be launching it during the Philippine Fintech Festival with a focus on ASEAN, and we call it culture tech because we are done with being the biggest market, one of the biggest market after Indonesia, of Korean content. We love Korea, don't get me wrong, I love Korea. As a matter of fact, I said this when I did one of the keynotes in the Korean FinTech Week last, a few days back. I just came from Seoul, I love them to pieces. Indonesia and the Philippines are two of the biggest um, uh, consumers of Korean content, Indonesia being number one. Number two, I think, is um, uh, Japan. Uh, third is the Philippines, and fourth is South Korea. And uh, there is something that we need to take from there. Because by energizing culture, applying technology, and monetizing it, as this fine young gentleman said earlier, we are able to create a ripple effect in the economy that will cascade to tourism, cascade to food, cascade to manufacturing and everything else, right? So I think what we all want to call on everyone, starting with this fine gentleman investor and even um, from this centralized platform over here is please energize culture. I'll start with mine, my industry, which is FinTech. And what we will do is we will energize the culture pillar in ASEAN by embedding services, embedding loans, embedding insurance and healthcare to the content creators. We will stop making them anonymous 
in the financial services sector. That's the first thing we're going to do. We're going to recognize them formally, even if what they have as their asset is digital assets. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to um, recognize them as a genuine industry, uh, meaning um, we're, going to, uh, we're going to work more closely with them in helping them create more revenue models uh, by embedding them in e-commerce and other hard industries. So that's what we'll do, and we hope to see all of you when we celebrate everything ASEAN during the Digital Pilipinas Festival in November. Thank you. Thanks, Amor. So, gentlemen, I think you have your homework set out for you. Um, <laughs> um, but Amor did also mention about technology, you know, which is, uh, again, another hot topic, AI, chat, EBT, you name it. So I wonder, gentlemen, um, if we talk about technology, how do you see technology has or will reshape the creation, distribution, and consumption of content? And um, how do you think we can leverage technology to harness these opportunities? Decentralized. Decentralized. <laughs> and what else? Danny? Well, I think like technology is keep growing and keep evolving. And I've been investing in, like, in technology. But one thing like the technology can be double-edged sword. I think like AI, we need to rethink about the AI in terms of like in terms of creative it will kill a lot of content creators like so quick. Yeah. So like if the, the regulation is not in place, you will, the two million people, it will be literally like nothing, you know. I think like the hardest part, I mean, we loved AI, we love like the new technology, but like we, we also scared on like what it will cost the, the in terms of the ecosystem in in, in Indonesia or like in ASEAN, because we're not there yet. We're not like United States, we're not like Japan, we're not like Korea, we're like way, way behind. So we need to leap. So I think like, I mean, I'm thankful like with all these big players like, you know, coming to, to the region, mm. I will hope that like they will invest on local content, they will, I will hope they will invest on on like talent academy if you if you guys like from london if you guys from like anywhere in the world open academy here train people teach people i mean that's the whole the only thing that we can catching up if it's not we just gonna be the biggest market in the world well yeah darren i think you have the huge leaps in technology <laughs> there are also all the small incremental steps that you take like I think Amazon was one of the pioneers for e-commerce, but one of the, the lesser known but very frequently experienced minor step forward in technological innovation, if you will, is just having customer reviews on the website. It, it wasn't there before. You have the reviews now. Now you see it on every e-commerce system. Mm. When it comes to online entertainment, Netflix paved the way with online streaming. And I think all the players are also trying their best to make improvements so that it's just a much more seamless experience for, for the customer. On Prime Video, we have this X-ray feature. So when you pause something, there's an overlay. You see the names of all the actors. Sometimes you have trivia as well. And if you click through, you go to IMDB. The, and you may end up going down the IMDB uh, hole instead. So when we launched some of our original shows in, from Southeast Asia, like last week, we launched Comedy Island Thailand and Comedy Island Indonesia. I'm oh, sorry, Comedy Island Philippines. The, the, the details of all the local cast, the directors, producers, and so on is available on X-Ray. Mm -hmm. I think these are tiny technological innovations that just help discoverability of foreign content. And when you think of all the different technologies that are constantly improving, I think there's also a lot of room for a content creator or an IP owner to monetize their content in multiple channels. You have uh, animation from Singapore called Oddbots. It's available on YouTube, on um, Prime Video, on Netflix in, in different regions. And now on, on the e-commerce side, Amazon is supporting Oddbots in selling their merchandise around the world. So you have Oddbots, figurines, soft toys, 
pencils and so on. I know because my kids keep asking me for them. And they're being enjoyed by customers from Mexico to, to the UK. So I think with just from the very basic fact of access on ease of putting up your, your items for sale or putting up your show for viewing, like these basics make a huge difference to the aspiring entrepreneurs or creators here. And along the way, I'm sure there's going to be a lot more improvements, including on more disruptive kind of technologies that eventually could lead to, to further improvements to very basic systems. Yeah. Excellent. So I think um, we can be confident that used well, technology can assist us with the growth of the industry. Um, on that note, I know we're already running out of time. I do want to ask for a final word from our panel about the future. One thing you think would contribute to the ideal future of the regulatory measures that will support an inclusive growth in this industry, in this region? Who'd like to go first? Danny. Uh, I like to wish that like a tax rebate, tax incentive that will happening in the region. Because right now is the only country that doing it. I think like either Thailand or and also Malaysia and Singapore, Singapore like for they, they provide like four thousand dollar or something or like it's not even funny. Like but it's too small. But like I think like with tax rebate, tax incentive will help to promote like tourism. I mean, who doesn't watch it, pray and love, and like doesn't go to Bali? That's the big example of it. I mean, right now Indonesia. I hate to say this, but most Indone uh, most film from Hollywood portraying Indonesia as a terrorist or an escape country of a bad guy. Which is sad, you know. I think like with tax incentive, it will change that. Probably this Hollywood people doesn't know Indonesia, so that's why they like, you know, they just like assume, making things up on that one. So I think that's like will help. Tax incentive from Danny Amor. Promote, protect, and preserve culture using technology. Technology. Darren. Oh, I'll follow on the P theme, protect, promote, and preserve. I'll just throw in pragmatism. So I, I think if we take a step back, we're actually still a super young industry that is constantly changing. It's so dynamic. You, uh, it, it's so hard to think of the right policy right now. And I, I don't feel there needs to be a rush to regulate, especially when you don't see a policy issue or challenge or something that's at even close to the breaking point. And I think pragmatism in timing is important. Pragmatism in the design of the policy is also important because you don't want something that will not get you to your objective and in fact causes more harm. But it's, it's such a tricky space, and I don't think anyone has the right answer. So pragmatism, I think with humility as well, that no one has the monopoly on answers. Let's all figure this out together. Yeah. On that note, I'm afraid that's the end of the session. So I don't know about you in the audience, but I'm going away feeling stimulated, energized, and positive about the future. I will certainly take some of these ideas into my conversation with my colleagues, including with ASEAN, together with my colleagues from the UK Mission to ASEAN, to see what we can do in our power to support the inclusive growth. So thank you to the organizers for allowing us with this session, and a round of applause to our esteemed panelists, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you for staying with us. That's a wrap. Together. And sure so, ladies and gentlemen, let's give another big round of applause to our moderator and our esteemed speakers for our last panel today. Thank you so much for your energy and all your insights on the stage today. And with that, 
Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as we draw the curtains on this enlightening and also impactful event, we find ourselves at a moment of reflection and also inspiration. We have followed discussions, dialogues and special addresses we've witnessed and has deepened our understanding of the themes that shape ASEAN's journey toward unity, progress and prosperity. And in the spirit of collaboration, ladies and gentlemen, that defines ASEAN, I would like to express our sincere gratitude to all of our speakers, our panelists and moderators who have shared their expertise and perspectives with us. And to everyone, to each and every one of you who has been part of this event, thank you once again for your presence. And before officially closing today's agenda, I would like to quickly share some information happening right now. We'd like to invite all of you to come join us at the ballroom at the side, ballroom two. We will have the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023 closing ceremony by the Coordinating Minister for Maritime and Investment Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, His Excellency Mr. Luhut bin Sarpanjaitan. We welcome you to join us at Ballroom 2 to listen to his closing remarks. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, excellencies, I'm Sasha Lauda. It is such a pleasure for me to guide you and to be here with you throughout today. Thank you once again for attending the ASEAN Indo-Pacific Forum 2023, implementation of ASEAN Outlook on Indo-Pacific. Thank you and we wish you a wonderful afternoon. See you again. Is a large state is a large state-owned enterprise that focuses on the MSME segment. BRE Digital Innovation continues to be carried out to facilitate customers in providing services to continue to give value to Indonesia. BNI harus semakin proaktif dan responsif. BNI terus konsisten untuk mendorong UMKM kita naik kelas. BNI berkomitmen dalam program-program pemberdayaan UMKM untuk Go Global. In Bank Mandiri, we are already one step forward, pioneering Indonesia's transition to low carbon economy by pursuing net zero emissions on operational by 2030. Let's put our hands together to create a brighter future. Mining Industry Indonesia, Mind ID, we explore natural resources for civilization, prosperity, and a brighter future.